Welcome everyone to the first day of Network H2's first academic conference, Hydrogen Field Transport uh, Integration with the Whole Energy System. I'm Tony Roskilly, I'm Professor of Energy Systems at Durham University and a Director of Durham Energy Institute. And I lead the Network H2, which is a national research network on hydrogen field transportation funded by uh, the EPSRC. Please visit our Net Zero Research website to find out more details of the research uh, we fund and the dissemination activities uh, we have and will continue to organize. Over the next three days, we will hear from academic and industrial leaders who are engaged with research and innovation challenges across the different forms of transportation as well as in the developing of the supply chain to support the hydrogen transition. This first day is structured around challenges in hydrogen transport applications. So today is organized in two sessions, morning and afternoon, and we are delighted to welcome speakers from industry to provide keynote presentations at the start of uh, both sessions. The academic presentations delivered today will provide a range of perspectives, some of the research that has been funded by Network H2 uh, and others undertaken by research working on sister projects. We look forward to hearing a diverse uh, approach and engagement and perspectives and findings and hope that this will stimulate further ideas of hydrogen research and innovation. We're delighted to have over 200 registrations for today and we're really looking forward to listening to the presentations and hearing your thoughts on what they have to tell us today. Um, these discussions will help us shape the research community and the future activities and we really value your contribution and feedback. So without further delay we will move to our first session and I would like to introduce our first keynote uh, presentation. So our first presentation is going to be from uh, William Darby. He is a principal consultant with Element Energy, focusing on the development strategies for low carbon technologies and in particular hydrogen as a fuel for heating and transport. William manages a number of UK leading projects, including UK Aggregated Hydrogen Freight Consortium and Hydrogen Refueling Infrastructure Projects. So over to you, William. Thanks very much, Tony. I'll just put uh, my slides up on the screen. So <clears throat> Tony's done a fantastic job uh, of introducing me. Uh, and as he said, I'm going to talk for about half an hour, uh, generally sort of about the state of the hydrogen mobility industry uh, with a focus on the UK, uh, talk a little bit about some of the barriers, um, and then uh, some of the ways that we're seeing and the sort of early lessons uh, for how uh, we're seeing hydrogen being deployed both in the UK and around Europe and basically how the UK can learn some lessons and start looking towards the future uh, in regards to it. So just to kick us off, um, I suspect there's a pretty good, a pretty good understanding of hydrogen mobility, but I think it's always useful just to outline what the uses for hydrogen in mobility are. So hydrogen is a, a clean uh, gas. It can be used uh, either in a traditional combustion sense, uh, very much like a sort of compressed uh, natural gas engine uh, and just replaces diesel or fuel or, or petrol in the combustion chamber. Or more kind of uh, futuristically, it can be used in an electric drive set. So that is uh, pretty much the same architecture as a battery electric car it has uh, electric motors, it even has a small battery, but uh, instead of plugging that battery in to charge it, uh, it's charged by an electric current generated by uh, hydrogen uh, recombining with oxygen in the air. The two systems have uh, different pros and cons, um, with obviously combustion engines having had uh, over 100 years worth of uh, scale up and R&D, making them very much uh, cheaper to manufacture, uh, but we do obviously have some uh, potential problems with uh, lower fuel efficiency and potentially some kind of uh, 
uh, nitrogen oxides created from the combustion process. Uh, on the fuel cell side, um, it's more efficient. Uh, the drivetrain is uh, quiet because it's electric and effectively the only uh, emissions are uh, water vapor. But one of the major cons for it is that it is expensive. My focus of my presentation will talk more probably on fuel cells, but uh, certainly happy to, to have questions or conversations about hydrogen and combustion engines, which is seeing uh, a lot of excitement at the moment. So where are we in the UK? Uh, we currently have uh, a fleet of around 450 uh, fuel cell vehicles operating in the UK, and that is, has been growing fairly steadily over the last uh, five or six years since I've been uh, engaged in the industry. Similarly, we have about 13 filling stations with uh, six different station operators. That's in a slight state of flux at the moment, and I think uh, what actually you can see generally from the breakdown of vehicles that may surprise people is still the majority of vehicles is, is lighter duty passenger car vehicles. Uh, and that is probably a hangover from the logic that went five or 10 years ago that uh, fuel cells uh, were a great option for passenger cars. Uh, clearly, there has been massive um, improvements in battery electric vehicles that has generally shifted the sort of consensus that battery electric uh, are probably one of the, the primary options uh, for passenger cars, although we would note that uh, there is still a place for fuel cell vehicles in that sector. And what we've seen, I think, is an increasing focus on the heavier duty sector. So particularly buses, where Wright Bus, a UK-based uh, fuel cell manufacturing, uh, sorry, hydrogen bus manufacturing company, is now vehicles in operation, um, in daily operation in the UK. We're starting to see the emergence of the first sort of heavy duty uh, fuel cell trucks in the UK, which is very much exciting. And that is seen by industry as an area for uh, rapid growth. In terms of where the UK is, and I suppose the progress in Europe. So we're somewhere, I suppose, where we'd probably expect to be looking at some of the other countries and, uh, and economies in Europe, uh, in certainly the top uh, quartile of uh, vehicle deployments by countries, but certainly uh, lagging behind the likes of uh, Germany and certainly France, um, but also having learned quite a lot of lessons from what's gone on in Germany. So you can see uh, in the stations per year point, German uh, state has deployed I think it's now approaching uh, over 200, uh, certainly over 100 um, hydrogen refueling stations and has what is still a very low loading uh, of vehicles per station, which basically means that the German state or someone has spent a lot of money building hydrogen stations that still aren't being particularly well used. And, and the UK has definitely learned lessons from that and is proceeding at a pace that is probably slower than Germany, but is looking um, to link vehicles specifically to station deployment. Um, and what you can see, I suppose, certainly on the right, is that there is still a pretty positive progression of hydrogen refueling station construction across Europe. And we expect that kind of uh, shape to continue uh, through the, the following decade. So in terms of progress and lessons, what have we learned so far? There's a few points, I suppose I'll just talk about why hydrogen is seen as useful and interesting in a mobility context. One of the key ones is its operational flexibility. So fuel cell vehicles can uh, be operated in, in a very similar way to a traditional petrol or diesel vehicle. So um, there's a reason why petrol and diesel vehicles have been used uh, for over 100 years. It's because they are wonderfully versatile. You can fill up a vehicle with over four or 500 miles of range in uh, under 20 minutes. Um, and hydrogen can do very much the same, possibly slightly slower than diesel in the fueling, and probably today slightly lower ranges, but we would certainly expect those kinds of um, specs to match diesel over the next four or five years as the technology matures. As I've sort of alluded to, it is an ultra low technology. So particularly with, it, with uh, fuel cell engines, the only emissions you're getting is water vapor and you can manufacture hydrogen in a low or even carbon negative way uh, to uh, 
drastically reduce the carbon emissions from transport. One of the interesting things, this is a specific to fuel cells that I uh, like to highlight is local authorities are obviously very uh, concerned about air quality at the moment. Fuel cell vehicles actually go above and beyond battery electric vehicles in improving air quality. Uh, that comes from displacing a diesel vehicle, but also the fact that a fuel cell vehicle uh, takes oxygen out of the air and it has um, an air filter uh, on the front of the car, so it actively removes particulates from the air. The, the sort of second and, or the fourth and fifth ones um, are becoming, I suppose, increasingly important as the world starts to recognize that the next uh, global leading economies are going to be clean economies. So there is a massive opportunity for UK growth. Obviously, here today on this call, we have a lot of um, the research and development community, but also clearly we have legacy manufacturing and high end engineering uh, skills base, which hydrogen, particularly as a clean fuel, is very well suited to. And the reason for that is the mineral intensity of the hydrogen economy is very low, but the engineering intensity is very high. And that obviously matches up with what the UK currently has as a workforce versus uh, mineral intensity. I suppose if you compare that to somewhere like China, which has massive mineral resources, but not necessarily such similar high end engineering then uh, that kind of uh, illustrates the point. Similarly on en energy security, this is obviously becoming a huge uh, topic of discussion at the moment. And I'll just pick out exactly why I say improving energy security. Clearly, all clean energy that can be manufactured in the UK is improving our energy security by reduce reducing our reliance on imported uh, fossil fuels. But specifically, Hydrogen and fuel cell technology doesn't necessarily move, shift our energy security reliance away from fossil fuels and towards, let's say, for example, lithium with batteries. Uh, fuel cells can be made from relatively abundant materials and they can be recycled uh, pretty much completely. So it actually moves the UK onto a footing where we could in the future be uh, unreliant pretty much on mineral imports from other countries and, and relatively self-sustaining and exporting of our energy. The other points then, there are a number of myths around hydrogen that uh, may have been true uh, a number of years ago, but because of the rapid progress that I was just illustrating on the previous slides, uh, these are becoming sort of increasingly untrue. So the main one that's sort of thrown around is efficiency. Now this is um, a relatively, in some senses, a relatively simple argument. In some senses, it can get uh, very gnarly. So I won't go too far into it, but the fundamental point is the battery lobby would, would argue that if I have an electron of clean energy produced from a wind farm or a solar farm, it's most efficient to go into a battery electric drivetrain uh, to displace diesel because you get more useful work out of that uh, electron than you would if it went to hydrogen because of the supply chain efficiency of converting that electron into hydrogen, compressing the hydrogen, transporting the hydrogen and converting it back into electricity. While that is true, it's becoming increasingly less true as we shift towards ultra rapid charging for uh, battery vehicles and also as the whole uh, hydrogen supply chain becomes more efficient. And I'll illustrate that in the following slide, but obviously what we're seeing, and certainly in research, I'm sure Tony and his colleagues can back this up, is next generation fuel cell um, and electrolyzer technologies. Electrolyzer technologies today are around 60% efficient. Uh, we're certainly seeing uh, increases in that up towards the 70s and 80s as it scales up and matures, and certainly lab-based technologies are moving towards 90% efficiency, and the same sort of thing is, is occurring through uh, fuel cells. But the other point is efficiency, or those electrons, are not the same types of electrons. We're moving into a state of our energy system where we have an oversupply of low cost intermittent renewables, and hydrogen is a great way of storing those uh, renewable energies and deploying them at a later date. Uh, for the likes of mobility. So it's a kind of combined system approach, which battery electric vehicles obviously can't store energy anywhere near as long term as, as hydrogen can. So 
price is a fairly simple one. Again, I've got a graph on the next page, but historically, uh, people would argue that the price of a fuel cell vehicle is too high to make it a cost-effective way to decarbonize uh, technology. Uh, that is obviously becoming less and less true as we scale up. Technology readiness, that is effectively a sort of reliability argument of fuel cell vehicles and the station are increased, are too unreliable to be able to use uh, in daily operations. Again, those who are kind of aware of how technology develops understand that the, the first prototypes of anything are relatively unreliable. As you move into series manufacture, that reliability becomes increasingly uh, good. And then the last one around the CO2 impact. So I've spoken about sort of ultra low carbon technologies. Clearly, um, the CO2 impact is something that is banded around a lot around hydrogen. Um, particularly, I think, as a way for energy companies or fossil companies to sort of greenwash their uh, operations. I think the reality now is the UK's introduced a new ultra-low carbon hydrogen standard, which any new um, hydrogen production facility will comply with. And that ultra-low carbon hydrogen standard is actually lower carbon than the current grid carbon mix. So if you were to charge your battery electric vehicle, and use it with the grid mix today, uh, and you were to refuel a hydrogen vehicle under that low carbon hydrogen standard, it would actually be lower carbon intensity with that vehicle. So that myth very much kind of going to bed. This I think is some of the most powerful data around the reducing capital costs. So this is uh, on the left here. I think you can probably see my mouse or hopefully. These are price ranges of fuel cell buses over the last uh, 13 years or so, and what we can see is effectively around a 66% reduction in fuel cell bus costs from around one and a half million euros uh, to today, uh, well under half a million euros, and certainly tr trending towards kind of cost competitive or capex competitiveness with battery electric vehicles uh, for the next generation. So that is a fairly significant uh, capex reduction that we've seen. The same applies really for efficiency. So the first generation of fuel cell buses needed about 20 kilos of hydrogen to drive 100 kilometers. This next generation is about under six uh, kilos of that. So that kind of efficiency point is kind of coming out in the data. And obviously, well, I'll, talk to, I'll just talk about the efficiency in the, in the TCO in a second. But the last one then around this kind of technology readiness and reliability the reliability of the vehicles has been uh, proven relatively beyond doubt. So we've had now uh, vehicles operating for tens of thousands of hours uh, with sort of uh, similar to diesel um, reliability and stations are kind of proving that if you scale up a station, it becomes reliable by sort of fundamental factors. So if you think of a traditional diesel station today, uh, it may have um, five, six, seven pumps. Uh, so if any one of those pumps breaks, the station is still operational. The same applies for hydrogen. Basically, the first stations were built in what's called a series, where you have a kind of uh, hydrogen tank, a compressor, and a dispenser. And if any part of that series uh, breaks, then the station is out of action. Increasingly, larger hydrogen stations are being built in parallel, where you have multiple compressors feeding multiple different dispensers. So if one of those uh, breaks the station uh, continues to be operational. And what's sort of uh, happening then, all three of these uh, myths are coming together to significantly reinforce each other in driving down the vehicle's total cost of ownership. So what we have here is a study by Roland Berger around fossil fuel trucks. You can see they've taken date in 2023, 2027 and 2030, showing how the sort of ownership cost, which is effectively combining everything, capex, opex, uh, other maintenance or sundry costs into a single sort of ownership cost for a, an operator, shows how the ownership cost of, of hydrogen vehicles or fuel cell vehicles has or is coming down and will come down at some point to transition below diesel. And that obviously comes from these trends that I've talked about, but also increasingly from the fact that diesel vehicles are receiving less attention, carbon taxes are increasing, uh, other operational constraints like zero emission zones are being put on diesel, uh, which is making 
hydrogen more and more cost competitive. So what does that actually mean in practice about hydrogen's maturing offer? So we've been involved in the hydrogen sector as Element Energy for about 20 years, and we've seen a number of companies go down this kind of learning curve over that time. So Toyota is probably the, the brand name and household global leader on hydrogen technology. Uh, they've been involved in this for about over 20 years, I would say. And what we're seeing now, particularly from Toyota, is commercially ready, quite beautiful, reliable cars coming onto the market that can be purchased um, pretty much off the shelf. Similarly, UK bus manufacturers, Wright Bus, as I've alluded to already, has a fleet of uh, hydro liners, as they call them, uh, in operation today. Uh, we're seeing, again, a number of uh, van suppliers, particularly Vauxhall and Renault, emerging onto the market. On the heavier end of the spectrum, we're probably slightly less mature, so there are a number, I'll talk probably about it on the next slide, but there are a number of European truck OEMs developing hydrogen products in terms of actually what there is today in the UK. Uh, the likes of sort of Teva, Electra, Plan Zola, which is sort of part of the Daimler Group, can supply you with a, a heavy duty truck. And then sort of more into the sort of diverse set, you've got the likes of Plug Power, who have, I think, the largest fleet of fuel cell vehicles uh, across the world in operation. They've targeted kind of factories, uh, materials handling type units, have a uh, pretty significant fleet and a viable business case for those types of vehicles. And obviously, interestingly, we've seen the Zero Avia plane. This is not the complete set of vehicles that are available. There's a load more coming onto the market in the, few, in the next few years. This is just a set of sort of what we would see as some of the most mature vehicles specifically in the UK today. Similarly then, uh, I suppose what we've seen from government in the last few years is a, is a massive uptick in interest in hydrogen. So a few documents that have come out over the last two or three years was the hydrogen strategy, transport decarbonisation strategy, which uh, featured hydrogen for mobility heavily. We've seen the industrial energy security strategy, which doubled the UK's targets for hydrogen production. And what we've seen then is a massive kind of response from industry to these government uh, targets. So all the way along the supply chain, you've got sort of production announcements, dispensing announcements, and vehicle announcements coming uh, increasingly online. So these are sort of massive companies with a track record of delivering, talking about billions of uh, certainly dollars, euros, pounds investments, and you know, hundreds of stations, thousands of vehicles uh, emerging onto the network. So I won't talk through all of these statements, but uh, it's just to give you a flavor of the sort of general excitement around hydrogen. Uh, that is definitely not to say that all of these statements are going to come true. Uh, but it is showing that uh, companies are really seriously considering hydrogen as uh, an option. So in terms of scaling deployment then, so the main thing, again, I've alluded to is this kind of cost barrier. So where we are today is there are vehicles that could be purchased that are hydrogen vehicles, they can be made and they're roadworthy. The problem is we have this big financial gap, which operators, fair enoughly, are unwilling to bridge themselves because it's about twice the ownership cost to switch to hydrogen as it is to diesel today. That varies depending on vehicle type. So actually passenger cars is much lower than this, but uh, this is just to give you a sense of it. So we need to get from where we are today uh, with this kind of policy gap or need for intervention to somewhere around the 2030s where there is going to be this sort of inflection point uh, where, as I said, diesel costs are going up and hydrogen costs are coming down and it will just become business as usual. And so this is the sort of area that we do a lot of work in, is how do we bridge this gap? Clearly there's no uh, silver bullet necessarily, uh, but I'm gonna to talk to a couple of the ways that people are using to pull levers to bring that sort of financial barrier down. The first one is a very simple one to get your head around. It's capital subsidy from the government. So we started to see this coming in more and more, and many of you may have been aware of the announcement for 140 million for zero emission road freight trialing. So that's for 40 to 44 tonne articulated HGVs and the associated refueling infrastructure. That's up to 80% of the truck capital cost is going to be subsidized by the government between basically now and the end of Q1 
2025. And that's basically with government getting there. Uh, I suppose you could say ducks in a row to understand what the technologies are to back going out to uh, the banning of fossil fuel trucks in 2040. Uh, I would also just pause and say that there are schemes already in place for zero emission buses and increasingly so for maritime. Uh, the Clean Maritime Fund and Zebra are both in the process of giving away uh, tens if not hundreds of millions of pounds to zero emission technologies. Perhaps the smallest but possibly the most interesting fund is actually the Tees Valley uh, Multimodal Hydrogen Transport Hub Fund. So that is about to be launched. I think actually the 28th. September is the launch date for this. Uh, we're expecting around 25 million pounds of funding specifically for hydrogen vehicles. And that is basically all vehicles that isn't covered by the ZERFT funding. So any uh, road and fuel cell uh, and combustion road vehicles up to uh, 40 tonnes, that includes uh, maritime and aviation, is going to be supported by this, as well as the refuelling infrastructure, but not uh, the hydrogen production infrastructure. So that that creates a very interesting regionalized uh, opportunity for hydrogen deployments, again, on the same sort of timeline of Q1 2025 is when the money needs to be spent. So the bit that's you know more interesting, and I suppose the bit that industry can play its part in is aggregating demand. This on the slide you can see now is uh, known as the Swiss 1600 truck project. And it is relatively pioneering globally as a way of um, accelerating this rollout. So effectively, what, uh, what happened was a development company called H2 Energy grouped together a number of truck operators in Switzerland on the rationale that if all of these companies pulled together, standardized their orders for trucks, they could order a significantly larger volume of trucks and therefore reduce the capital costs of those trucks. And if they all agreed to utilize them along the same uh, motorway corridors, they could also aggregate their demand for fuel. And that obviously, as I talked to earlier, brings down the costs for the fuel. So that's industry pulling a lever of reducing the capital costs and reducing the fueling costs by essentially scaling it. I should note that there is a significant state subsidy from Switzerland amounting to around 50,000 euros a year um, for zero emission trucks, which has also helped to pull that lever. So I've already sort of, I suppose, spoken to this, but um, what, I was, what I'm just going to reinforce this message is if you could jump from a situation where we have in the UK today, where we're talking about 80 kilos a day, and for those who aren't aware, that probably is about two trucks fuel per day at a station to around a ton a day, which is sort of more like 20 to 30 truck refuels, you can significantly reduce the cost contribution of the station to the dispense price of the fuel. So uh, today we're sort of seeing, well, before the energy crisis, we were seeing uh, hydrogen prices of around sort of 12 to 15 kilos at these kind of 80 kilo a day stations. What we expect if we can get up to 20 kilos is around that sort of six to seven pound uh, a kilo mark. Again, that's slightly now uh, a different story because of uh, rapidly changing energy prices. And obviously that scale improves reliability. This is a bathtub curve, which effectively illustrates the point that um, if you're refueling more hydrogen from your station, you end up with fewer faults at the station. So I'll just put a bit more specifics onto this, right? So if, if we have government funds coming out in the UK, there is a sort of responsibility on industry to try to uh, leverage those funds as much as possible. And so I'm going to talk about two ways that this can be done in the Tees Valley and the Zerft. So the Tees Valley has already actually had a phase one, which deployed sort of mini ecosystem over three months uh, of trialing. So what you can see here, Element were involved in two projects, um, in part with Network H2 as well, um, around deploying this kind of fleet of buses, trucks, passenger cars, and forklifts. There were a number of other projects involved that included sort of uh, rigid trucks, vans, buses, boats, tractors. But the problem with phase one was it was not on a scale and not on a time length that uh, created a viable ecosystem. It basically only had £3 million of funding. 
that only took place over about six months. The next phase of funding, obviously, we're talking about 25 million. Uh, this is a, a, a table here that visualizes the potential opportunity that uh, we could take. So you could put together a multimodal, a collaborative bid uh, of a number of different vehicle types by a number of different vehicle OEMs with a number of different operators uh, using those vehicles, each of those operators taking to what to them is a relatively low risk step to take, you know, ones or fives or tens of vehicles, but benefiting from this ecosystem effect, which I think is, is best visualized here. You can see along the Tees Valley, there are a number of opportunities for vehicles to be deployed and effectively to cluster around sort of two or maybe three large hydrogen stations and therefore to reap the benefits of low cost fuel. The other one then is ZERF. So I spoke about this zero emission road fleet deployment. Tony's already uh, introduced that we coordinate something called the UK Aggregated Hydrogen Freight Consortium. And this follows a very similar set of steps. So we actually went out and uh, engaged with a number of the UK's largest uh, truck operators and mapped out or were engaged in a project to map out the movement of articulated trucks. And what, what it shows in this map on the right here is that there is a very distinct corridor um, from sort of East London up to Manchester, sort of branching off up to Leeds, which is the highest density of uh, articulated truck movement. So we've been engaging with a number of hydrogen suppliers and a number of truck suppliers to put together a project that effectively covers that uh, network. So you can see a visualization here of uh, the hydrogen station locations indicatively laid out, a number of the operated depots of these green bubbles. And we're looking to try to put together about four stations and between 50 and 100 trucks to make this a commercially viable hydrogen corridor. And obviously, I've already alluded to the beauty of hydrogen. You can pull in very much like a diesel truck, fill up your truck with hydrogen in about 10 or 15 minutes and leave the station with four to 500 kilometers of range. The point then, I suppose, about this is while those things might have started to seem quite siloed, if you take that logic and start to apply it across the UK, you can start to develop city-based hubs in the UK's major cities and link those city hubs up with motorway-based freight-type refueling stations. And what you get to quite quickly, without an enormous amount of investment or time, is a fairly basic skeleton refueling infrastructure for the UK. And again, with sort of 20, 30 stations and the range that hydrogen has, you can actually start to decarbonize a pretty large volume of operations with fairly minimal investment. So we've run some of the numbers on this. We think creating that kind of network, uh, the cost to government is of the order of two to three hundred million pounds. I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't mention the, the cost they're about to spend on the energy cap. And that gives you a sense of uh, it's actually not a huge amount of money. The other one that I like to use is it costs five million pounds to build a roundabout. So we're not talking about an enormous project on a sort of engineering point. The second thing I would highlight, which I think links to hydrogen as a sort of multi-vector fuel, is there is obviously a lot of interest around hydrogen's use in industry and hydrogen's use in heating. And what we've seen recently is the gas networks across Europe announcing a plan to put together what they're calling the hydrogen backbone. So this is looking at either repurposing existing gas grids or building new hydrogen pipelines to put together what is a fairly complete network of hydrogen pipelines to serve heating and industry. But the point that I would like to sort of bring out, and this is what we did with uh, Network H2, is there is a real significant overlap of where large hydrogen transport demands occur next to the existing gas grid. So there becomes a really interesting opportunity for a gas grid that contains hydrogen to start supplying that gas to the transport sector. And that obviously provides massive opportunity for the UK and the world to really, really drastically reduce the cost of supply for hydrogen to stations. And obviously that starts to unlock uh, a much wider set of use cases. 
So just to conclude then, hydrogen mobility, we've seen it mature rapidly over the last uh, five, 10 years. To, at today, we still need a combination of a collaborative approach from indus industry and also some support from government to achieve it. But we believe that once you get the snowball pushed up the hill to a certain point, it starts to roll down uh, certainly much faster than you could do with battery electric vehicles, where effectively you're talking about every new vehicle that needs to be deployed more or less needs uh, a charger or a fraction of a charger for it to be able to fill up. Hydrogen has this, this wonderful opportunity to scale up incredibly rapidly. And, and we think we're kind of coming to a point over the next five or 10 years where that inflection is going to be reached. And we can see massive uh, hydrogen stations being supplied by the gas grid, fueling up vehicles that are behaving very much in a sort of diesel type fashion uh, and have uh, a competitive total cost of ownership. So that's just, I suppose, a vision for where we might be going with hydrogen. That's the end of my presentation. Thanks very much for your attention. Uh, Tony, I'll hand back over to you for, for any questions. Oh, thanks very much, William. Uh, great presentation and gives us a, a really good start to the conference and a, an overview of where hydrogen uh, currently sits in the transport sector. So uh, let's move on to our um, next presentation, which is going to be given by Dr. Ramin Ras Isi uh, from University of Kent. Ramin will yeah. give a presentation on uh, techno-economic feasibility study of hydrogen-filled freight uh, transportation. Uh, Ramin is a, an assistant professor in management science and a member of the Center for Logistics and Heuristic Optimization at Kent Business School. He is also a visiting researcher at the Center for Transport and Logistics at Lancaster University Management School and a member of the Future Energy Group at the University of Kent. So, Ramin, over to you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I am presenting today the result of a research that we did as uh, part of uh, Network H2 EPSRC uh, research fund, and that was on uh, techno-economic feasibility study of hydrogen fuel uh, freight transportation. I will um, the, go th through um, the overview of the research that we carried out, a little bit of detail um, on the project itself, um, its a start date, duration, and uh, um, the details about the funder. Uh, I will talk about the background and motivation for the research, its objectives and contribution. Then I will speak about uh, demand production, storage, and transport scenarios for hydrogen that we adopted uh, as part of this study. Uh, uh, supply chain design with integrated centralized and on-site production uh, decisions was the key contribution of the study, which I will uh, discuss as part of this presentation. And finally, uh, I will present some findings and outcome and uh, some concluding remarks. Uh, so as I said, uh, this research uh, was conducted as part of the uh, techno-economic feasibility study of hydrogen fuel uh, freight transport. The project started the 15th of May last year and lasted until 14th of February this year. Um, the, the funder, as I said, was EPSRC through Network H2 and the project partners were uh, ourselves at the University of Kent, Harriet Watts University, Cranfield University and University of Ex uh, Exeter, and we were also supported by uh, Durham University. So a little bit about background and motivation and why uh, we needed to uh, conduct this research. Uh, so for one thing, freight transportation contributes over to over 40% of uh, transport uh, related emissions and it has the um, the lion's share uh, among all uh, transport related emissions uh, and 65% of this is just due to uh, road freight um, transportation only. These emissions are uh, not going to decline and uh, the, the projected uh, increase is uh, at the level of 40% by 2030 compared with the figures that we have for 2010. And unless we do something about this, the, um, uh, this is that is just going to rise. And um, it is very clear that uh, the uh, major lifeline from this current situation, uh, from the emissions from road freight transportation is shifting from fossil fuels to clean alter alternative options, such as hydrogen and electricity. 
But why hydrogen? So there are uh, several uh, reasons that um, uh, we think of hydrogen as um, the one of the uh, most promising alternatives for uh, diesel, for road freight, um, the transportation, particularly in long haul transportation. For one thing, hydrogen is 2.5 times more efficient than gasoline and diesel, and it can be produced from both conventional primary energy sources as well as renewables. Uh, as we know, blue and uh, green hydrogen. And it also contributes to the situation we are currently in, which corresponds to energy security. So it's the discourse is not just about going green, it is also about going secure um, the, and uh, generating the uh, energy that we need from renewables and not being uh, reliant on fossil fuel options. Um, it has multiple competitive advantages when we compare it to other alternative net zero alternatives, uh, such as electricity, particularly in long haul distribution, uh, it gives us longer driving range, much faster refueling time, which is a big issue uh, currently in uh, electric um, uh, vehicles uh, and the improved payload efficiencies and other improvement over the other alternatives. Okay, but uh, when we think uh, about using hydrogen for uh, the road, road freight sector, we are also facing with a number of uh, challenges. These particularly relate to the infrastructure, which is still non-existent or uh, uh, very much uh, in um, elementary stages for producing, storing, transporting, and distribution, uh, distributing the hydrogen that is required. Uh, for the uh, long haul freight transportation Next slide. and uh, designing um, uh, economically viable and competitive hydrogen uh, supply chain is not an easy task at all because uh, we have to think about all elements of the supply chain uh, from uh, production to storage to transportation and distribution and um, the optimal determination of all of these factors uh, including the production and storage facilities location, their technology, their capacity, and connecting them using cost-effective, uh, sufficient, and appropriate transport links is essential for um, having an economically uh, viable um, hydrogen supply chain. When we started this study, we identified that there are uh, the, most of the uh, studies focusing on techno uh, economic analysis of uh, hydrogen and its viability uh, for fueling the road freight. Uh, more generally for transportation sector um, use especially explicit optimization models for optimal deployment of hydrogen infrastructure. So the approach is normally to come up with a modeling tool which represents the hydrogen supply chain, uh, starting from the uh, downstream of the chain all the way to its upstream and understanding all the interaction between all elements of the supply chain and exercise different scenarios against uh, the proposed model to see how they interact with each other and what would the price of hydrogen at the pump uh, be um, against different scenarios that are exercised uh, against these models. Uh, one thing about uh, almost all of the models that we reviewed in the literature was that hydrogen is always assumed to produce centrally. Uh, and offsite. So uh, centralized hydrogen produ um, uh, production was uh, the key to the entire uh, hydrogen supply chain, which I will keep uh, referring to as HSC from now on. And in centrally produced um, hydrogen, hydrogen has to be uh, transported uh, to storage and then from storage to uh, refueling stations and distributed from there. Now, uh, it is ironic to see that uh, the, from the results uh, reported in all of these studies, we see that over 90% of the total cost of uh, producing hydrogen and getting it where it is needed is dominated by hydrogen storage and uh, the distribution rather than the uh, hydrogen production itself. So this uh, shows cost saving opportunities at the consideration of distributed on site, a small scale hydrogen production as well. Now, uh, the thing is, 
uh, one size doesn't fit all and we cannot just say we have to go on site hydrogen production all over the uh, supply chain because that is not cost effective at all and a combination of both centralized hydrogen production and on-site hydrogen pro production is the key contribution of this study which has not uh, been studied before so we uh, tried to develop a modeling tool where both on-site and centralized hydrogen production decisions could be made uh, simultaneously and see where it would be best to produce hydrogen centrally, store it, transport it, and where, where would uh, this make more sense to be produced on site. Um, so we developed as part of this research a tool for incorporating both on site and centralized production decisions into an integrated modeling framework. So the um, objectives and uh, contribution, the contributions of this research can be uh, summarized as follows. Uh, we are building a techno-economic model for understanding the economics of hydrogen utilization for land-based freight transport in Great Britain. Britain. We are developing a new hydrogen supply chain network design tool that integrates both decisions um, on the centralized and on-site hydrogen production simultaneously and um, the, we identify potential um, hydrogen uh, supply chain refueling stations for major AGV routes as part of this study. We include all a state-of-the-art blue and green hydrogen production and storage technologies in our scenario analysis and with uh, develop uh, key insights on the economies of establishing a hydrogen supply chain to support the routes of uh, hydrogen uh, HGVs. Okay, uh, to develop the model uh, that was needed and to carry out the techno-economic analysis uh, that was uh, one of the key objectives of this research, we had to first identify the demand. So uh, any uh, especially explicit hydrogen supply chain network design is essentially demand driven. And you can understand uh, the, about production, storage and uh, transportation needs uh, once you know about the demand and without um, the knowledge about the demand, it would be very difficult to do that. So we had to uh, identify how demand for hydrogen from road freight uh, transportation uh, look like and how demand is distributed. Where are the potential sites for hydrogen uh, refueling based on the current major routes of HGVs? And to do that, uh, we started looking at the data pertaining to current road freight energy consumption, as well as existing and potential refueling stations servicing the current diesel um, the heavy uh, duty vehicle fleet. Um, uh, and we looked at particularly data from uh, 2019. Uh, when we analyzed the data from 2019, and the main reason why we focused on 2019 was to, to uh, bypass the COVID uh, effects uh, during 2020 to 2022. So uh, looking at data from 2019, we noticed that uh, over 6 million tons of um, diesel was consumed by long haul uh, freight transportation. This translates to uh, over 5 billion liters of diesel and a total annual energy demand of uh, 49 billion uh, kilowatt hour when uh, converted to uh, energy demand. So this is a very uh, huge demand that if is supposed to be uh, satisfied uh, through a hydrogen supply chain uh, in terms of full conversion of the uh, fleet, when we think about converting the entire uh, AGV fleet to hydrogen fleet, for example, by the year of uh, 2050, this is the amount of um, uh, energy that we demand uh, that must be supplied by um, the, let's say the, the hydrogen supply chain. Now, in order to distribute this demand, this total realized demand in the, uh, the country, we had to identify where currently the AGV fleet is um, uh, doing the refueling for uh, diesel. We identified that they are normally refueling in their warehouses within ports and also in service stations. So we collected all the, the location of uh, these uh, facilities. Uh, we came up with a uh, record of warehouse facilities, service stations, and ports. And uh, after cleaning all the data set, we ended up with a set of 539 uh, candidate facilities for hydrogen uh, refueling stations. So once we knew where these locations were, we also had to understand what the demand at each location is expected to be. 
uh, direct data to each location was rather impossible and there is no publicly available uh, data on each station and each one of these points so we had to go down the uh, analytical route and um, after some conversation uh, with freight forwarders we understood that over 70 percent of 75 percent of refueling is taking place in warehouses and the rest is happening in ports and services stations so we came up with um, a distribution uh, of uh, the total demand required in warehouses based on the overall area and also the remaining out of the 75 percent total were distributed uniformly uh, among um, yeah, service stations and ports. The other thing that we had to collect some data on was uh, on the production. So uh, when we are talking about hydrogen supply chain, we are talking about uh, three key elements. Uh, the first one is production, the second one is the storage, and the third one is transportation. And we needed uh, to have uh, all the techno-economic details uh, uh, pertaining to each one of these key elements. The first one is production. And for production, as I stated earlier, we were looking at both uh, blue and green hydrogen production. For blue hydrogen production, we focus on a steam methane reformer with carbon uh, capture usage and storage, uh, auto reform, uh, reformer with carbon capture and storage, Autothermal reformer with uh, gas heated reformer with carbon capture usage and storage, and uh, green technologies uh, were corresponding to uh, alkaline electrolysis, uh, proton exchange membrane electrolysis, and solid oxide electrolysis. For uh, each one of these technologies, we identified a set of um, uh, data corresponding to their size, minimum production capacity, maximum production capacity, capital cost required projected over different years, uh, unit production cost uh, projected over this year, uh, different years, and all of these data were uh, collected from a uh, base 2021 uh, document. We also tried to identify ex uh, existing or planned hydrogen production sites in Great Britain, so we could uh, practice these um, against our modeling tool in our scenario development. So we wanted to see uh, what would be uh, the case if we consider existing hydrogen sites or, or the plan planned ones in the, uh, in, uh, the in satisfying the, the hydrogen needed by the uh, road freight sector and what's about if uh, this entire hydrogen supply chain uh, wasn't intended to build built from ground up so ignoring all the existing and in planning um, hydrogen production sites uh, to do that we uh, divided the entire uh, uh, gb into 34 different grids and we identified uh, existing hydrogen productions within these grids. So uh, this table here shows um, the, an indicative list of sites that we identified, the location in the grid. For example, T site locates uh, in grid 15, which is shown uh, on the left-hand side image here. And uh, we show what kind, what technology uh, is adopted within this site, uh, what is the capacity of the site, the, uh, claim ca capacity by the document we refer to, and when this is uh, expected to be operationalized by. So this data were also collected and fed into the model. Uh, as concerns hydrogen storage, we considered four different technologies for hydrogen storage corresponding to underground pipe storage, underground line rock cavern, underground salt cavern and overground compressed hydrogen gas tank at 700 MPa. And again, um, we uh, collect the data on their minimum storage capacity, maximum storage capacity, capital costs and unit storage uh, costs as well. And these data were collected from um, the different sources, um, uh, particularly from the literature. Similar to the case of uh, hydrogen production, for uh, uh, hydrogen storage also, we uh, try to identify uh, existing locations. Mostly these were corresponding to underground salt cavern uh, locations in the country. Um, again, um, this table shows where each one is located and what storage technology. Finally, the last element of the chain, uh, which is transportation. 
uh, we consider transportation using tube trailers only. So we uh, did not consider other uh, forms of transportation like pipeline due to lack of access to data. Uh, and in the case of hydrogen uh, for road freight transportation, uh, hydrogen in its gases form CH2 is the most reasonable uh, way to transport um, hydrogen around and two trailers are most probably uh, the main transport mode that will be used. So uh, again, for tube trailers, we collected all the data that we needed, including the unit uh, capacity, fuel economy uh, within the grid and between the grids. So when they are traveling regionally uh, or locally, uh, their speed, so we can consider that in their calculation to see how much fuel is consumed by the transport itself and different things like driver wage, fuel price, maintenance expenses, general expenses, and so on and so forth. So all of these data were collected uh, so we could run them against the, uh, the supply chain network design model, which I will discuss next. So as I said, the key uh, contribution of the study was in designing um, or developing a modeling tool for hydrogen supply chain network design where, where both um, uh, centralized and on-site hydrogen production modes uh, are simultaneously considered. And to do that, we uh, developed two-stage hydrogen supply chain network design. Uh, within the first stage, we uh, carried out demand modeling and uh, we developed a set covering optimization model to identify the location of refueling stations from all the candidates, 534, I think, uh, refueling station candidates that we uh, identified earlier. We wanted to know where should we set up the ultimate uh, refueling stations to support the routes of AGVs and uh, which one of these stations are going to be on site. So these are the decisions made in the first stage of the modeling tool. Once we identify this, this is then mapped into the grid structure, which I earlier discussed, the 34 grids. So we could know how much demand is within each grid. And then all of these were fed uh, along with production, storage, and transport data and parameters into the second stage modeling, which corresponds to hydrogen supply chain network design model. Again, another optimization model where we try to now uh, configure optimally uh, the production, storage, and transportation. And uh, this model now could decide um, where centralized, uh, centrally produced hydrogen is transported to which uh, refueling stations and where autonomy is given to a refueling station to provide its on-site hydrogen production. Okay, a little bit um, of technicality here. I don't know if I'm running out of uh, time or not, but I will uh, try to be quick on this one. So the tricky bit was to uh, identify how to consolidate different ref refueling stations into one refueling station and how to cut costs where possible. So uh, here in this image, I am showing an example where uh, we have, let's say, six different um, uh, candidate refueling stations with their different demands. Now, these candidate stations could be consolidated into one, and uh, if consolidated, they, they could uh, be candidate for setting up on-site hydrogen uh, production. Uh, now here, um, let's say gray circles show that we, we are able to establish um, uh, green hydrogen on-site uh, production and the black circles show we are able to establish uh, a small scale SMR uh, or any other blue hydrogen production at the site. When the circle is white, it is beyond the uh, small production capacity and we cannot have uh, on-site production there. So the base, because of the space limitation, it is not possible to go beyond a certain size for on-site hydrogen production. So different configurations and different ways to consolidate these refueling stations into one and then supply the on-site on Site hydrogen production are uh, shown here, and we uh, somehow imply the optimization problem involved here to identify what would be the best way to um, merge and pair these stations into a, a single station uh, and um, establish on site hydrogen production. This is the what is decided um, within the first stage 
modeling. Once this is known, this was passed to the second stage, hydrogen supply chain network design modeling, where uh, we uh, try to understand uh, how um, we should develop the chain with respect to uh, production, storage, and transportation. Uh, the model also decides where hydrogen is um, uh, produced uh, at the, the site of delivery uh, on site production and where it is produced centrally and delivered to uh, different grids. This table shows a set of uh, techno-economic scenarios that we uh, exercise against the developed model. So very briefly going uh, through different scenarios here, we have a baseline scenario in which we are uh, considering both on-site and centralized hydrogen production. We assume the entire uh, the AGV fleet is converted to hydrogen by the year 2050. Uh, we consider both blue and green hydrogen and uh, uh, with regard to site priority, which means whether we go with existing sites for hydrogen production or we establish new ones, we let the model decide. Now with um, uh, deviating from the baseline scenario, we could go with other scenarios. For example, when you look at scenario five, which is a key scenario uh, exists two minutes left, okay? Um, the, this is where the current literature is mostly is centralized only. So this will be a very good benchmark uh, against the, the developed model to see its added value. Uh, the only difference with baseline scenario would be that here we just produce hydrogen centrally and uh, ignore on-site hydrogen production. So this would be a good benchmark to see uh, how much improvement we are bringing in. Other scenarios show, uh, shown here, for example, this one is different in the sense that we just allow green hydrogen production and so on and so forth. So this is just a representation of the first stage modeling uh, demand uh, uh, modeling stage. So among all the, um, the second uh, figure from the left shows all the candidate refueling stations with their demand. Third figure from left uh, shows um, stations that we have opened and they have potential for um, uh, on-site blue hydrogen production. Fourth uh, uh, figure from left shows uh, stations that we have opened and our potential for on-site green hydrogen production. And red circles show stations that uh, we have not opened and instead consolidated by uh, nearby stations. Okay, this is just uh, um, a very simplified representation of, of uh, the configuration under scenario uh, zero, which is the baseline scenario. So for example, the blue squares here show that uh, hydrogen are produced uh, centrally in these grids and is transported to other grids where you see uh, circles, blue and green circles. These are the location of on-site hydrogen production. Next slide, please. So this will be, uh, I think, uh, a good uh, summarization of the added value of the uh, proposed uh, methodological intervention. With a simple, very simple modeling intervention and twist, we uh, can see here that the total capital cost is dropped by over a billion pound. And uh, this is really major. So if instead of just going uh, centralized, uh, and uh, mixing the decision between on-site and centralized, there is this much opportunity in saving in total capital investment, as well as total daily cost of hydrogen supply chain. So from around uh, 13 million pounds a day, you can be uh, going to under uh, 11 million pounds a day, which is again, uh, very much significant. The, just uh, a bit of concluding remarks, I will just rely on a couple of points here. Uh, for one thing, this study shows that we need around uh, three and a half billion pounds uh, investments to set up the required hydrogen uh, supply chain network to fuel the road freight of the future. But the main complication is revealed to be around uh, the uh, financial commitment required from uh, freight forwarders to convert their HDV fleet into hydrogen power HDVs, which is really huge, over uh, 400 billion. Uh, I think the risks are rather self-explanatory. For example, if we go uh, by just green hydrogen production, the cost will be greatly increased right now due to the uh, price of electricity. And I think I can stop it there then. Uh, Jackie, thank you very much.
Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ramin, for your uh, interesting presentation. Let's uh, move on to the second uh, presentation. This is going to be delivered by Dr. Krista Searle, a, an assistant professor at Harriet Watt University in uh, operations management and logistics and a member of the Center for R Sustainable Road Freight and the Center for Logistics and Sustainability. Her um, research interests are within the field of logistics, sustainability and behavior modeling with the application of operational research, uh, computer simulation, uh, agent-based modeling and data analytic technique. Over to you, Krista. Thank you very much for the introduction, Tony. All right, so as Tony alluded to, I'll be presenting on our, what we call the Athena project, which was an analysis of a strategic hydrogen refueling infrastructure. All right, so the challenge we faced going into this project was very typical in the situation where we're looking at the deployment of hydrogen refueling infrastructure for certain corridors, focusing specifically on heavy good vehicles, HGVs. So obviously uh, there's a few research questions that comes up and uh, these are just some of the few. So we are looking at what are the refueling demands that we're looking at for HGVs? What is the minimum number of hydrogen refueling stations required to serve this said demand? What are the geographic locations and capacities required for these hydrogen refueling stations? And then of course, what is the best hydrogen dispense and delivery model to follow? So the aim of this project, very simply put, was to analyze strategic corridors in order to determine and recommend a hydrogen refueling infrastructure for effective deployment. And for this, we developed sort of a um, concept demonstrator to illustrate, to illustrate this, um, the project aim. And this was specifically focused on the strategic corridors in the UK or GB, focusing on the north of England, the NP11 region. We focused again specifically on heavy good vehicles, HGVs. When it comes to the hydrogen production supply, we considered both on site, so on site is localized production, and off site, which is centralized production of hydrogen for the different refueling stations. And when it comes to the delivery of hydrogen to the hydrogen refueling stations, we limited to, in this specific study, to tube trailer deliveries. Right, so finally, the idea is that we will be able to determine an optimal network for hydrogen refueling infrastructure um, and to identify the number of refueling stations, the location, capacity, and type of refueling stations, the hydrogen supply configuration of the refueling stations, and then the overall cost that is involved. So our Athena model uh, consists of three um, sort of phases or stages. The first um, is looking at the demand data analysis. So here we get some raw data um, from logistics data. We're looking at existing and potential refueling sites that can be used. And that forms part of, um, as the input into this demand data analysis. And our output for this stage is a spatial temporal analysis of the demand of hydrogen. And this then moves into the optimization model and analysis. Um, which is the second phase. And here we take a much more strategic view um, and trying to, from a strategic point of view, determine what is this hydrogen refueling infrastructure network design. So we take the input from the demand data analysis, as well as input from data on production storage facilities, on delivery and dispense technologies. And then this can then finally go on to a third phase, which is more operational, where we use an agent-based simulation model and analysis, so this is the point where after making strategic decisions about the locations of the hydrogen um, refueling infrastructure, you can now actually go into um, specifics in the operational sense, um, for example, um, the storage capacity at each individual refueling station. So you can have different experiments, different scenarios, you can play with uncertainty, stochasticity, trying to look at the robustness of the system. And at the end of the day, the idea is then that you'll have a robust hydrogen refueling infrastructure and network design. Right, so let's um, move straight into sort of the first phase, which is the demand data analysis. Um, and again, the output here that we want to see is a spatial temporal map 
of demand. So we want the area and we want to see it over different points in time. So our first step here was to collect different input data. Um, so as, as Raman also alluded to, about 75% of upliftment of HGVs in terms of their fuel is currently occurring at warehouses. So we look, looked at all the different warehouse data and we started with just over 1,700 records of warehouses in GB, filtered it down to 626 based on size and sort of uh, where we would see HGVs fill up. Um, things that are key features here was the longitude latitude, so exact locations, as well as the total area. And why that was important is we assumed a certain correlation between the size of a warehouse and its capacity as a refueling point. Um, and like I previously said, we only considered records with a total area greater than uh, 9,000 square meters. So we ended up with about 382 records um, of warehouses. And here is an illustration of them, of all the warehouses in GB, um, and just showing the different uh, total area, um, which differs according to the icon size and the color. And again, you can clearly see all these clustering occurring, and also a lot here in the north of England, which is also the area of focus for the study. All right, and then um, the next step was sort of looking at data on service stations in Great Britain. So we had about 291 records with different features, cleaned it up to just over 110 records. Um, and key features here is we only consider HGV service stations and we have the exact locations as well. So here is just uh, all of the service stations plotted that we were using in GB. Um, and then last sort of um, um, facilities or existing or potential facilities for a feeling was the ports. So we had about 53 records um, cleaned. Again, we have and filtered out 48 and we use specifically latitude and longitude. So here they're also plotted within the map. Great. So then we sort of zoomed into our area of focus, which is as previously mentioned, the NP11 region, um, north of England. Um, and when we look at the HGV demand side, we came up with about 213 demand side um, of about 158 of them warehouses, 43 service stations and 12 ports. And we've also, after you know, speaking to, um, to various subject matter experts, we now said it, it's about 40% of the total HGV demand in Great Britain. So after having collected all of the specific data on the, um, the sites, we're looking at raw logistics data for heavy good vehicles. So that is things like the total monthly fluctuating HV pat uh, fuel patterns in GB, and also the freight data. So looking at the density per road link in England, specifically in the north of England, um, which can be measured in terms of the heavy good actual flow data. So here's a representation of it. And you can see all the different road links. And the thicker the line, the more dense it is. So it's just talking about how many heavy good vehicles flow by on that specific road link every hour. Um, and we use this data as input as well. Um, and I'll, I'll speak on that just now. So after we have gathered all that input data, we then convert the diesel fuel demand to an energy demand. And then we start distributing the demand, the energy demand we have between all of the different demand sites. But now you might ask, how do you distribute it according to um, you know, what is actually happening in terms of the demand at each site? So we have to consider the distribution between um, the sites looking at the type of sites. So where we previously said warehouses, there's a greater refueling happening at warehouses than at service stations. So we have to consider the site types. Then secondly, we calculated a popularity estimate based on, based on the HGV logistics flow data. So that's primarily for the warehouses. Um, sorry, not for the warehouses, the warehouses, ports, and service stations. We could estimate based on all the road links and um, the HGV um, flow data on the different road links and the proximity to each one of these sites. Um, you can sort of calculate a popularity estimate of each site. And then for the warehouses, we look at both that popularity estimate and the size of the warehouse, um, assuming that larger warehouses can have larger refueling capacity. So we distribute it according to that and for ports and services only according to um, this popularity estimate. 
So now we've distributed them on among the different sites. Um, and then we also started to map this um, in two different time dimensions for the hydrogen demand, and we call it the rollout and mature phase. Um, and here we also did some clustering um, just to have sensible um, mapping. And here is sort of the output of this, the so spatial temporal analysis of the hydrogen demand and the rollout phase that's estimated for about 2027. Um, there's about 0.1% um, conversion of HGV demand to hydrogen, that's sort of assumed. Um, and this is sort of the spread um, of the demand between all the um, refilling sites. And then it's estimated in a mature state, which is looking about 2040, that if let's say 50% of the HEV demand were to be converted to hydrogen, this is what the, um, the daily demand mapping would look like. All right, so after we've done that analysis, we can then move forward to the optimization model and analysis. So as I previously said, this is a strategic system design. We're looking at the number of refueling stations required, the location capacity type of these stations, what is the supply configurations for each station, and what is the total costs involved here? So for input data, we have um, some productions and storage facilities that we assumed are in use. And I think it was about five or six green um, centralized production facilities that we're considering here. Um, delivering dispense, as I previously said, we're looking at both the centralized and the localized production, on-site and off-site um, production. But for distribution, we only considered um, using tube traders in gases form. The core of this optimization model is to minimize the cost. In terms of cost features, we're looking at the hydrogen refueling station setup and storage cost. We're looking at off-site transportation and unit production cost. And we're looking at on-site setup and unit production cost. We have some decision variables here. That is what is the model output, what it tells us at the end of the day. And that is the location of each hydrogen refueling station, the capacity of each hydrogen refueling station for each station, whether it should be on-site and or off-site production supply, and it also includes the quantities. So we have this feature there and or, so it can be both on-site and off-site. And I'll speak on that a bit later as well. If it is an on-site, it also needs to select the size of the electrolyzer. And for off-site, it needs to show us from which facility, centralized facility it will be, and what is the number of deliveries that will be made. So we also have a few constraints that are sort of built in. The first thing is, um, that we can merge demand from different sites. So demands from sites within a certain range may be merged and we use a maximum coverage distance. Um, that is sort of the name of this, this factor that we're using. And we're saying, um, for example, in the mature stage, the maximum coverage distance is two kilometers. So we're saying that if a site is going to become a hydrogen filling station, it has the opportunity to cover the demand of all other sites within a two kilometer radius. Um, that's basically what it, what it uh, comes down to. Um, and it may be merged, but under certain conditions, given that, for example, it doesn't exceed the maximum hydrogen feeding station capacity. Um, and all demands, the third constraint there, all demands need to be satisfied by at least a single hydrogen feeding station. In other words, no demand gets left behind. We're still covering all of the demand although we might not use all of the initial sites that we gathered from our initial data analysis. So there we had all of these number of sites that can basically be seen as potential sites to be used, but here we decide which of these sites actually become refueling stations and how should the demand be merged. And then the fourth one, all hydrogen refueling stations demand must be supplied for either on-site or off-site production. Um, for onset production, there's some certain maximum capacities. We're looking between uh, 1 to 250 megawatt electrolyzer. For, for the deliveries, when we're looking at centralized, there's a maximum number of three deliveries per refueling station per day. And these were sort of the constraints um, that were set into the model. All right, so let's look at some of the results. So this is for a rollout phase, estimated 2027. Um, so you'll see we have these, uh, the orange lines is the transport links, which tells us that there's definitely a centralized production and it's a movement of tube trailers occurring. 
uh, a green um, dot shows sites that are has offsite production. And um, the blue dots is the supply points. So these are the specific centralized production facilities we're considering. And the, the red ones are inactive. So they were initial sites of demand, but they were inactive when the demand was shifted to another refining stations. We're looking here at at least eight hundred refining stations. The largest um, being about eight hundred and fifty kilograms per day. The smallest around seventy kilograms per day. Um, and interesting enough, that the model here advised that everything should be offsite. So you can see, for example, there's the production site, centralized production here in Leeds, which will deliver to these specific sites. Um, and similar to in, in Liverpool um, and Hull, and also um, they close to uh, the site close to uh, Newcastle on time. Then for the mature phase, um, it's a, a lot more sites. So we're looking at uh, 189 refueling stations, the largest um, just over 23,000 kilograms per day, so 23 ton, um, average 5.5 ton per day. Um, and in terms of the hydrogen supply, we have approximately 1% that is on site, so using an electrolyzer, 75%, um, which is a combination of on site, off site, and then 24%, which is completely off site. Um, so you might wonder, okay, but it's quite strange this idea that they can use both on site and off site. Um, and why, why would you do this? Um, and we started also looking into this and, and trying to investigate what is happening there. Um, and one of our analysis was looking at specifically the mature phase now, investigating the only on site versus only off site. So that is when you're saying, okay, only on site is only localized production, only off site means only centralized production and um, supply to the specific refueling stations. So in the case we were looking at only on site or localized production, there was an increase in cost by roughly 18%. But then the case with only off site production, so centralized production, there was a decreased cost, and these increase or decreases from the base case where we just showed previously. There was a decrease by over 30% um, in the cost. But, and here's the trick, it showed that it um, sort of needed an average number of deliveries per day that exceeds nine, which is not necessarily feasible. So looking at our findings here, um, we're seeing that the system optimality is limited by the number of deliveries per day. Um, and this also indicates the opportunity for something like pipeline. And this is just another illustration of sort of investigating that increase in number of daily deliveries allowed. Um, and you can see here on the X axis, we have the number of daily deliveries allowed moving from two, three up to eight. Um, and then on the left hand Y axis, you'll see it's a portion of um, hydrogen refueling stations. And on the right hand Y axis, it's the number of daily deliveries actually occurring. Um, and then you'll see it just has a split between uh, the dark blue, which is only offsite, and the lighter or green, which is onsite and offsite combination, and then the pink, which is only onsite. So we can see here that for a number of daily deliveries allowed of two, we can see this corresponds to an average number of daily deliveries of roughly two. Um, but what we see here, which is interesting, is it doesn't increase linearly. So when we have four, a number of daily deliveries allowed, the average is less than four deliveries that are actually taking place. Um, so it doesn't increase linearly. Um, and the idea is that if we were to exclude this, this on-site and off-site, um, and we allow something like pipelines, the majority would then um, probably be delivered by off-site or centralized production via the usage of pipelines and tube trailers, and then a smaller percentage of on-site. All right, so just to um, sort of give a brief overview also of the third phase, uh, which is a bit more on the operational system design side, um, and that's where we can use uh, a tool such as agent-based simulation modeling and also perform certain analysis on this. So for this type of agent-based simulation model that we also built here, um, the input is from the optimization model. So you take the infrastructure as designed in the optimization model, that's the input of your agent-based model. You have three types of agents. You have your refueling stations. You have the centralized production facilities and the cheap trailers moving around. And you're keeping track of the behavior of each one of these agent classes. 
as well as, um, um, for example, the full level uh, at the refueling stations uh, or the production levels at the centralized production. So there's different um, individual characteristics and parameters that you're also keeping track of. And there's multiple experiments and scenarios so that we can include here, things like capturing a stochastic demand profile and not just a very deterministic demand profile as is used uh, within the optimization model. And you're also able to capture this unserved demand um, and also vary the capacity of the hydrogen and feeling stations to really look at what is the specific size required. Um, and an example of, um, here's an example of the model itself and how it can play out. Um, and you have all of these different stations. You have the production, centralized production facilities, uh, and the red ones here it just indicates where there's a need for um, to be refueled. And then I don't know if you can see there are little trucks. There's a black truck meaning it's filled um, and it's traveling to um, to replenish at that refueling site. And then there's a little white truck driving back uh, to get more hydrogen. So here's an example of just one analysis we did about the sizing of a hydrogen refueling station at the mature phase, where we vary the capacity of the hydrogen station, um, looking at the um, at whether it should be at 100% capacity and uh, decreasing it all the way to 50% capacity. And it's definitely a trade-off between cost savings and unserved demand. What we see here, again, on the left axis is our cost savings, so savings, um, carrying almost all up to 15%, but there's also an unserved demand um, that we can see on the right y-axis. So as we start decreasing the hydrogen refueling capacity, we start saving costs, but we also increase our unserved demand. And there's a trade-off between the saving and effectiveness of the refueling station that needs to come at play here. And that's sort of just a wrap of the Athena framework that we have developed, again, just focusing on the demand data analysis that drives us input for our optimization model, where we look strategically at how we can identify what this refueling infrastructure should look like and how we can design this network. And then we have the ability to do some operational tests and experiments at an agent-based model level. Just like to share some of the successive projects that came out of here. Um, and one was the multimodal hydrogen fueling um, transport study we did uh, with the UKRI Strategic Innovation Fund. Um, it was a Northern Gas Network led project with uh, us at here at Watt University, Durham University, Element Energy, Transport for the North, Reese, and Eversholt. Um, and what we did is we, we sort of build upon the work we did in Athena um, and in this work, but we um, sort of expanded it to look at multimodals. So we looked at buses, refuse collection vehicles, and port hanging equipment as well. And then also expanded the hydrogen delivery to include pipeline. Um, and uh, it's sort of, um, Will also touched upon the work in his presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Krista. Excellent presentation. Um, I'd like to go into our next presentation which is by uh, Dr. Eni Oko from Newcastle University. So Dr. Eni Oko is uh, a process and energy systems engineer and a senior lecturer in chemical engineering at Newcastle University. He has over 15 years of industrial and academic experience. Uh, Dr. Oko's uh, research spans the area of carbon capture and transport, green hydrogen production, energy storage and energy systems analysis and integration. Over to you. Thank you. This is just a summary of our research um, that was kindly funded by the network H2. This, um, in our project, uh, we worked with uh, partners from the Crownfield University Aerospace Center and uh, Robert Gordon University. In my presentation today, I will talk you through a little bit of the background um, um, hydrogen storage options, um, ammonia as a history carrier, the research landscape, um, key activities um, in our projects and results, and of course, conclusion. So um, generally, like the keynote speaker had already spoken a bit about the net zero target um, in the UK. 
of course, um, um, had to habit sectors um, such as the transport and heavy industrial sectors um, all require a bit of force which um, to be able to meet the net zero target. And this is where um, hydrogen comes in. So um, looking at the diagram here, um, of course, we can see from what we all know that hydrogen is ahead of uh, most, um, most fuels in terms of gravimetric uh, energy density. Um, <clears throat> the key area of our work is basically as regards um, the storage and uh, transporting uh, um, hydrogen. Um, this, this is an issue for a number of reasons, one of them being, being the safety aspect of it. Um, it has more, um, greater potential for explosion. Um, the other point again is that um, if it is, if hydrogen is to be transported in compressed states, it requires um, very high pressure, um, which is very expensive and brings about some additional risk. Then in terms of um, when it's transported in a liquid phase, there is also a problem, uh, which is very low temperatures, cryogenic conditions of around minus 253 degrees C, which again is expensive and poses additional risk. Um, the other point also with liquid hydrogen, which is the favored in most cases, is that it, the, the storage facility is a lot more complicated. And in the case of uh, transport sector application, it will also require very long refueling times, um, which are not going to be very, very suitable um, for, for switching um, to hydrogen. And all that makes a case for um, hydrogen carrier materials. And this is where our project comes in. This is uh, a bit of highlight of different hydrogen carrier materials, um, physical absorption, physical storage systems, and quite a number of materials has been investigated to date in literature. Um, but uh, most of the materials that have been investigated so far have uh, very low hydrogen um, carrying capacity. And of course, um, the, most of them also operate at very low temperature. Then there is also the uh, liquid, liquid organic compounds, which again have low, um, low hydrogen carrying capacity. The reactors for um, uh, using this application is also very complicated. And the energy requirement for extracting the hydrogen uh, from, from these compounds are also high. Then the last category are just chemical compounds that are slightly different from the unsaturated liquid organic compounds. Um, and the, a very prominent example is ammonia. Um, we, have, we are working on ammonia for a number of reasons. Um, ammonia performs better than most of the most of the um, hydrogen um, carriers um, in a number of areas. One of them being that the um, storage capacity is high, um, higher than most of them. The volumetric density is also high. <clears throat> and of course, um, the storage condition is, uh, uh, it can be stored and used at very mild conditions around 10 bar and 25 degrees C. Then the other very important factor is um, there is a long-standing industrial experience um, regarding ammonia storage or transport. Um, if we look at this uh, figure here, this is just comparing ammonia with a number of um, hydrogen carriers. And we can see that with respect to the volumetric density that um, ammonia is actually ahead of most of the common um, hydrogen carriers out there. Then the other key parameter, which of course we consider when um, looking to select an appropriate hydrogen carrier is the energy requirement for um, liberating um, hydrogen from the carrier. Okay, so if we look at ammonia here, you can see also that ammonia is also doing um, better than many popular um, hydrogen carriers, except of course uh, methanol. But however, it has a better storage capacity than uh, methanol. A key, a key part of 
using ammonia as a hydrogen carrier um, is the is the reactor where the um, hydrogen is liberated from the from the ammonia. And currently in literature, two technology routes have been proposed to um, have been proposed for achieving this. One is through thermal tracking, and the other is through electrochemical decomposition route. Now, thermal tracking operates at very high temperature. Um, electrochemical decomposition have, um, have existing catalysts that operate at temperatures as low as 250 degrees C. However, the electrochemical decomposition route is still at a very early stage. So our work is focused mostly on the thermal um, tracking route. So what we are looking to develop is to develop um, catalysts that can operate at a lower temperature to make it more you know, cost effective for implementation in, um, in an onboard application. Um, regarding our project objectives, what we wanted to do is to develop and assess onboard ammonia, you know, looking at overall system design um, and analysis for onboard implementation of ammonia um, in a scenario um, where the, um, the aircraft or, or as it can also be applied to um, the marine sector where, it's, um, where it uses hydrogen fuel. So the ammonia becomes like a carrying agent for the, for, the, um, <clears throat> for the hydrogen. The other thing that we hope to do is to do some analysis using a typical airliner. We've used the ABOS A380 for this analysis. The purpose for that is to do some light for light comparison with respect to existing jet foils. So our, our, our proposition was looking at using um, <clears throat> Our ultimate proposition is looking at using membrane reactor, having it's a very simplistic diagram of what we're trying to develop. So we have ammonia um, that's from storage, liquid ammonia from storage, goes through um, a, cracking, <clears throat> a cracking reactor where it's cracked and the hydrogen can be extracted and then be used either in airliner application or ships or trains or, or HGVs. Um, in terms of research landscape, this is just a highlight of what's going on in this area. You know, um, an indication that um, we are not we are not alone in our proposition, so to speak. Um, last year, the UK Science and Technology Facilities Council um, formed the JV and basically came up with um, with this concept um, to uh, <clears throat> to try to develop. Um, an ammonia an ammonia powered aircraft application, but this time using an existing modifying existing um, jet engines. The key difference with their application is that they are looking to only partially crack the ammonia rather than fully cracking the ammonia. In our, in our studies, we are we are looking at fully cracking the ammonia. Um, there is also um, a NASA grant to University of Central Florida earlier this year, also looking at a similar case, which is to pre-crack ammonia and use a mixture of ammonia and hydrogen as as the um, as as the jet jet engine foil. So going forward in our in us, um, the very first aspect of our work has been to develop. Um, Block flow reactors, which is very similar to what um, STFC is proposing, um, developing a jet um, um, a plug flow reactor, um, <coughs> plug flow reactor model, and using this model to evaluate the performance of different um, catalysts. In this particular instance, we have um, evaluated the performance of a lithium amide catalyst, which is which is um, a very promising um, class of catalyst for a number of reasons. Um, one of them being that they are readily available and they are also um, more cost effective than more established um, catalyst that uses routine. All right, we have uh, implemented the uh, kinetics of this reaction using custom modeling 
and uh, then importing them and using them in our Aspen Plus model. The key thing we have, we have uh, investigated is the conversion in this reactor. And the, the, the key finding for us was, was, was the, um, the conversion in the reactor declines rapidly um, in the reactor. Of course, this points out the equilibrium limitation as uh, hydrogen uh, tends to recombine with N2 to form ammonia. This makes a, a strong case to, for membrane reactor, which, which is what we propose to use in our, in our project. Um, the other thing that we have done is um, using computational method to evaluate the performance of different um, catalysts. What we do by that is um, we use a computational approach to um, uh, locate and characterize the transition state for specific catalysts and estimating um, the energy barrier. Once we have that information, we can also estimate the re uh, reaction reaction kinetics and, and the rest of them. This is very useful for modeling because um, part of the limitations of uh, doing this uh, aspect of our work is, um, is because um, is that um, the kinetics of most catalysts reported in literature are actually unavailable. So it's virtually difficult to model some of these catalysts. So from what we are doing, we are able to then also esti uh, estimate the kinetics for the reactions. Okay, so um, <clears throat> this is the procedure we have followed in our calculation. We are using a DFT-based model um, in a software called ADF. And um, <clears throat> we, we use that as a, a computational material chemistry software. Um, it begins at this stage where we build the molecular geometry for for the system that we are um, for the for the reaction, of course, including the uh, with the catalyst in place, and of course, um, adjusting the nuclear coordinates and the lattice vectors to achieve the total uh, to minimize the total energy. Then um, we also do a potential energy uh, surface scan, and this is actually the step where we are able to identify the transition state for the particular, um, um, with the particular catalyst. And the transition state can then be optimized and, uh, and characterized um, once, once um, identified. And this is a, a sample of um, some of the results that we have obtained. This is, um, this is uh, um, the transition state that we obtained for one of the Tenum based uh, um, um, catalyst. And from, from the various um, uh, catalysts that we have uh, assessed, we have results like this, um, which enables us you know, to compare the energy barrier for different um, catalysts. And the catalysts, we've done this for like uh, so many of the catalysts. And with, um, with an information like this, we can then determine the um, catalyst that uh, uses the list that will require the list of the least amount of um, energy input when used in the ammonia cracking application. The other thing, um, of course, this part of the work has been done by um, RGU and um, the team at RGU is developing a, a, a dense palladium uh, membrane. And they have used the electroless uh, plating uh, approach to prepare to prepare um, a dense membrane, and then tested the dense membrane to determine its performance for um, selective permeation of of hydrogen. This is uh, what the alumina support they have used in their experiment looks like, and this is the final membrane that was now tested. Um, this is uh, some of the results they have reported. Of course, this has been published somewhere. And uh, they were able to achieve um, over 99.9% um, hydrogen purity at the temperature of 873K. As, uh, of course, at higher pressure, the, the, the operating temperature um, begins to decline a bit. And also, this is the hydrogen flux that they have obtained at at the same pressure, um, 0.4 bar, looking at 
um, different uh, temperature. Of course, what is key is that at higher temperature, the at higher temperature, the um, the hydrogen flux um, obtained uh, increased and went higher and higher. The other uh, aspect of our work is um, what um, um, our colleagues in Cranfield has done, which is to do some initial assessment to determine um, the specific requirements that uh, that you you will need when implementing this kind of system in an, in an aircraft that is the size of a Boeing three 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 eighty, and they have extracted some information from from literature regarding the Boeing and of course the fuel, the jet A fuel, which the Boeing 380 uses. Um, and uh, from the uh, analysis that they have done, they have found um, <clears throat> a fuel volume ratio of uh, 2.65, which means the storage capacity for liquid ammonia, ammonia is going to be at least 2.65 uh, times the storage uh, uh, capacity for uh, uh, for the jet A fuel. The other the other um, calculations they have done is to look at um, the um, storage space for um, for the for the ammonia, and they have estimated a very huge uh, capacity of um, nearly a million a million um, a million liters of liquid ammonia on board and have done some estimates of, of, of the tank sizes and obtained um, a tank, a, a tank, a cylindrical tank length of around 26, um, 26 meters. And on that basis, they've proposed um, having two storage tanks, one towards the fuselage um, and one another towards the back compartment. Of course, the, the idea of having the storage tanks on, on, on the wings is not very feasible in this application. Um, this is partly because we are hoping that the liquid um, ammonia is going to be stored at the pressure of um, around 10 bar. And this kind of pressure cannot be you know, supported by the wing design of uh, current aircraft. It only points to um, the fact that um, for this type of application, you, you require some sort of top-down uh, design of the aircraft. You know, rather than uh, in current propositions um, where they hope to simply um, modify existing um, um, design. Yeah, in conclusion, um, the catalytic membrane reactors are required to achieve maximum conversion um, due to strong uh, equilibrium limitation. Um, our new dance palladium based membranes that developed um, achieved over 99.9 percent h2 purity um, which is very good and then lastly um, the onboard storage of liquid ammonia um, requires very high um, volume space and this would mean a new bottom up um, airliner design and just uh, lastly a um, few weeks ago we've been afforded uh, we've been awarded a follow-on funding um, where we are um, basically going to be using the catalytic membrane reactor uh, design developed in this uh, project. Um, the founder will be making a formal an announcement by next week. All right. Thank you. And thank you to um, Network H2 and the EPSRC for the funding. Thank you very much, uh, Annie, uh, for your uh, great presentation. And really good to hear that you have secured uh, follow-on funding yeah. um, in this research. Our um, final presentation before lunch is going to be given by Jesse Smith from uh, Cambridge University. Um, Jesse is a PhD student working within the energy group of the Energy, Fluids and Thermal Chemical Division. Her research focuses on energy consumption and the behavior of hydrogen and other low carbon systems within aircraft. Over to you, Jesse. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for having me as well. Um, 
So uh, my presentation today is on a model I developed of a liquid hydrogen aircraft. Um, I developed it with my co-author and my PhD supervisor, Professor Mastrakos, who unfortunately isn't here today, but he's very much a part of this project too. Um, so today I'll go through the energy systems model I developed. Um, it, the hydrogen aircraft is uh, fueled by grid derived liquid hydrogen. Um, the aircraft performance was assumed to develop over time due to firstly the tightening of aviation emissions reduction targets, um, electricity grid decarbonization with time, and also the development of technologies on board the aircraft and also those uh, that go to, into producing the hydrogen. Um, the model uh, that I developed was used to identify niches within the aviation system uh, for which uh, hydrogen, liquid hydrogen may be favorable. And I'll go through some of the, those niches in this presentation. But first let's look at how I designed the liquid hydrogen aircraft. I started with a conventional aircraft and the data on it. Um, and that was used to produce the hydrogen aircraft. The um, aircraft I used was a Boeing 787, which typically carries 242 passengers and its design range is 13,600 kilometers. Now I used the data on this aircraft and I made a few assumptions uh, to produce this liquid hydrogen aircraft model. Firstly, the maximum takeoff weight of a hydrogen aircraft could not exceed the conventional aircraft weight. The maximum landing weight could not exceed the conventional aircraft uh, uh, landing weight and the volume had to be less than that of the conventional aircraft. Um, of course, conventional aircraft are usually um, powered by kerosene, but a hydrogen powered aircraft's uh, energy pathway is a little bit more complicated. In this presentation, we assume that electric, uh, hydrogen is derived from an electricity grid, which has partially fossil fuel and partly renewable um, electricity going into it. So there is some emissions associated with the input electricity. We assume that electrolysis is used to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, this uh, hydrogen is then liquefied using more grid electricity, and this is what is used on the aircraft. And we can either have an aircraft powered by fuel cells and electric engines, or we can have an aircraft that is powered directly by gas turbines, like a conventional aircraft. Both of these technologies are currently being developed. We also compare our hydrogen power aircraft with natural gas, which is also liquefied like hydrogen. And we do this because uh, kerosene has a high carbon intensity. Liquid hydrogen has often has a relatively low carbon intensity and natural gas lies somewhere in between them. Also the energy density, the volumetric energy density of natural gas is somewhere between kerosene and liquid hydrogen. So it uh, provides a good middle ground for um, a comparison fuel. We also look at dual fuel aircraft. So we look at combining hydrogen with fossil fuel and they both go into powering um, a combustion engine. Uh, so that's also an option that we look at. There are many other uh, types of fuels and fuel pathways that a model can model, but uh, we are only looking at these ones in this presentation. We look at a time frame of 2021 to 2050. And in this time, we assume that the, as I've said, I think that the aviation emissions reduction targets will tighten. Uh, the electricity grids will decarbonize and the components crucial to the energy pathway of hydrogen will develop. Uh, so firstly, let's look at the tightening of the emissions reduction targets. We assume that we're using the International Air Transport Association IATIA targets. The IATA assumes that from 2020 to 2050, the emissions of aviation will increase if, if we don't do anything to try and reduce the CO2 emissions. And that's because the demand for aviation will increase. However, there's some measures we can take to reduce these CO2 emissions. We can look at known technology operations and infrastructure and also economic measures to decrease CO2 emissions to a certain degree. However, what we're focusing on here is the opportunity of alternative aviation. So we're, what we're really interested in is the um, reduction of the green line relative to that of the pink line. And if we assume that liquid hydrogen aircraft completely replace conventional aircraft, we say that um, the emissions has to be less than or equal to 
57.5% of that of the conventional aircraft to meet these IATA targets. And these emissions are expressed as well-to-wing emissions per passenger kilometre. And all we mean by that is well-to-wing is uh, essentially the source of the energy. So uh, the emissions associated with producing the energy all the way through to the emissions produced during flight. So well to wing looks at the entire energy pathway. And the reason why we express the emissions per passenger kilometre is to normalise for the aircraft performance and the aircraft demand. If we have um, an aircraft that can't quite complete a journey, but two separate aircraft can, we need to make sure that their emissions are still 57.5% of the conventional aircraft's um, emissions. So that's all that that means. We also need to look at the electricity grid decarbonisation with time. Now, we link uh, the energy consumption of the aircraft to the emissions of the aircraft using this quantity called carbon intensity. And what this is, is the carbon, uh, carbon dioxide emissions produced per unit input energy required on board the aircraft. And because we're using grid derived uh, liquid hydrogen, we need to look at the electricity grid's carbon intensity. And this graph is quite a lot. But what we have here are the decarbonizing electricity grids of different regions. So we've got Asia specific, uh, Pacific, sorry, Asia Pacific, Europe, Africa, and some other regions too. Um, and we also have a world average grid that decarbonizes over time. And we've compared these to the carbon intensities of jet A and natural gas. A quick observation we can look, see at 2030, the world average grid has slightly lower carbon intensity than Jet A. Um, what that means is that if we have uh, two aircraft, one fueled by liquid hydrogen and one fueled by Jet A that have exactly the same welcoming energy, uh, the liquid hydrogen aircraft will have slightly lower emissions than the Jet A aircraft. We also need to look at component development. As the component Components that we focused on were the fuel cell, the electric engine, the electrolyzer, and the liquefaction unit. And we looked at a proton exchange membrane fuel cell in our um, aircraft design. So we have the PM fuel cell efficiency, we have the PM fuel cell's power density. So what we mean is power per, per unit volume there. Electric engine specific power, so power per unit mass electrolysis efficiency, and the energy required to liquefy the hydrogen per kilogram of hydrogen. And that's electrical energy that we require. And what we've done is we've taken multiple literature sources rather, um, and we've fitted um, a best line uh, fit to them. And that's what we use in our model. We use our best, best estimate and our regression fit is based on an S curve as shown in the top right hand corner here. And what we can see is that each of these uh, quantities improve over time, some more than others. So what does this mean for the performance of the hydrogen fuel cell aircraft in 2050? Well, we can assess this by looking at the mass breakdown, the volume breakdown, and also the energy breakdown of the aircraft. And we assume that this aircraft carries 242 passengers, just like the con uh, conventional Boeing 787. And we assume that the grid derived hydrogen is derived from the world average grid that we saw a couple of slides ago. So let's first look at the mass and the volumes. Well, you can see the, the mass of each of the aircrafts are very different, but the volume is the same. And what this tells us is that we've met the volume of uh, the conventional aircraft, but our mass is, our aircraft is very much lighter than conventional aircraft too. The reason for this is that liquid hydrogen is about an order of magnitude less dense than kerosene, than jet A fuel. So that means that if we completely fill up our aircraft with hydrogen, we're still going to have a lighter aircraft. What does the energy breakdown look like? Well, our conventional energy pathway is quite simple, which means that we've got quite a simple Sankey diagram here. Uh, the aircraft is 42% efficient overall, um, and that is because this is the efficiency of the gas turbine engines roughly. 
Our liquid hydrogen aircraft is a bit more complicated than this. We have uh, a much more complicated energy diagram and we see that it's about 39% efficient from well to wing. And that's interesting because it's only a couple of percentage points below that of uh, the conventional aircraft. And what that says is that even though we're using each of these different components in the aircraft, they're all much more efficient than the gas turbine. And what does this mean for our performance? Well, we can say that the range of the aircraft is 4,600 kilometers, which is a lot less than the range of the conventional aircraft. And this is just because uh, the liquid hydrogen is a lot less dense, which means that you can fit a lot less energy on board within the volume comprised of the aircraft. The energy per kilometer, per passenger kilometer rather, is 92% of the Boeing 787. And this is because uh, even though they have similar efficiencies, uh, this aircraft is traveling way less far, which means they actually uses a lot less energy uh, per passenger kilometer. And we see a similar thing with the emissions. The emissions per passenger kilometer are actually within IATA targets. And what this means is that we can actually take some passengers out of the aircraft and replace it with fuel and still remain within the emission reduction targets. So what, that's exactly what we're going to do on the next slide. Um, this is exactly the same aircraft, but instead of just looking at 242 passengers, we're looking at a range of passengers. And you can see that across the X axis. The range is on the Y axis, and that's how far, obviously, the aircraft can travel. And these lines that we see are the different constraints of our model. So the gray line represents where the volume of the aircraft is equal to the volume of conventional aircraft. Above this line, the volume is exceeded. Below this line, uh, the volume is less than the conventional aircraft. And along this line, this is the range that we can achieve when we have when we have the same volume as con conventional aircraft. Similar things are seen for the final mass and also the initial mass. That is completely off the screen now. Uh, this is where the final mass equals the maximum landing weight. And what you can see is that the volume constraint is a lot below uh, the mass constraint. And this stands to reason because on our previous slide, we saw that the volume was at, at, when the volume of the uh, conventional aircraft is the same as the hydrogen aircraft, uh, the mass of the aircraft was very light. We've also got an energy constraint. So to the left of this line, the energy per passenger kilometer is greater than the Boeing 787 energy. And to the right, it's below. And we have our emissions constraint. So to the left of this line, the emissions uh, exceed the IATA targets. And below, uh, sorry, to the right of this line, they um, are below the IATA targets. So we want to remain to the right of the pink line and below the gray line. Um, and the maximum range we can achieve within these constraints is where the black circle is. This is how we maximize the range. Um, and at this point, we carry 204 passengers and can travel a range of 6,000 kilometers. So the maximum range that this aircraft can travel is 6,000 kilometers. We also can look at other aircraft. So if we just take the emissions and volumes constraints, from the previous graph, the teal line is what we saw before. This, um, the maximum point of this is 204 passengers and 6,000 kilometers. But we've also got the LH2 gas turbine aircraft here, the Jet A aircraft within the emissions constraints and the LNG aircraft. And you can see that these ranges are maximized at very different points. And this is to do with the different energy densities and the carbon intensities of each fuel, as we talked about earlier. And you can see that the LNG aircraft does especially well, having 223 passengers, so almost as many as the design number on board the conventional aircraft, and 10,500 kilometres is its range, which is almost as far as the conventional aircraft can travel when there are no emissions constraints on it. Finally, we look at dual fuel aircraft. So if we combine the characteristics of a uh, liquid hydrogen, LH2 stands for liquid hydrogen, by the way, and LNG stands for liquid natural gas or liquefied natural gas, just should mention that probably. Uh, but if we look at an LH2 aircraft with a gas turbine and a jet A aircraft with a gas turbine, we can say that a dual fuel aircraft that has 50% 
liquid hydrogen and 50% jet A by volume, uh, essentially the constraint lines lie directly between uh, the constraint lines for each single fuel aircraft. And what that means is that we can say that the maximum range occurs at 286 passengers, which is greater than that of the uh, gas turbine aircraft, and it's 6,700 kilometres, which is greater than the range of either single fuel aircraft under emissions constraints. So we see that we can sometimes have advantages by combining two fuels together and combining the low carbon intensity of hydrogen with the high energy density of jet A. So what happens if we instead take region specific electricity and look at how aircraft taking off from specific airports around the world behave? Well, this uh, diagram shows uh, the crosses show the origin of each flight. And we assume that uh, electricity near there is used uh, to fuel the hydrogen or to, to produce the hydrogen rather. Um, and the circles represent the maximum range that can be achieved if you take off from uh, the cross of the same colour. If we look at North America only, and that's the one in blue, uh, we can see that the liquid hydrogen aircraft using North America specific electricity uh, can travel 10,900 kilometres in 2050. And that is more than the LNG aircraft can travel. But it only carries 65 passengers and requires 3.25 times the energy. And this is a problem. So firstly, the number of passengers is a problem because to meet the demand, you'll need more aircraft, which has economic problems and also air traffic control problems because you've got more aircraft in the air. Secondly, the energy is a problem because this is 3.25s. Uh, so say you took all of the kerosene aircraft at JFK and you replaced them with liquid hydrogen. This would mean you require 3.25 times the energy that's in the jet A for this process. But this doesn't come from jet A. This comes from a low carbon electricity grid. And we know that low carbon electricity famously is in short supply. We're, our, our, one of our greatest challenges in the future is trying to decarbonize our grids. So we have a massive availability problem associated with the energy. Other places in the world like uh, Latin America and Europe have uh, similar trends. They can't quite outperform the LNG aircraft, but they can still travel very far, but they don't carry many passengers and their energy consumption is quite large. However, if we look at Africa, the Middle East, Asia Pacific, CIS, aircraft traveling from these regions can't travel as far, but they have more passengers on board and the energy consumption is lower. What this means is that we kind of can't win um, if we have a, an aircraft that travels a great distance, we need to have less passengers on board and we need more energy. But if, uh, um, if we have more passengers and, and less energy consumption, we actually can't travel very far. Just to hammer home that this is not a localised problem, if we um, average the energy around the world, we need 1.6 times the energy of the conventional aviation system. Uh, and this was this calculation was done just by taking those numbers on the right for the aviation demand in 2050. Lastly, what happens if we tighten the emissions targets? Uh, the targets that currently exist for aviation today have often been criticised as not being ambitious enough. Well, if we instead say that we want to achieve 1.5 times the IATA targets, and by this we mean um, at least um, a reduction to 36.25% of the conventional Boeing 787, we get these results. Now, this is for the Europe average grid, and I'll break it down by the different aircraft. We'll start with the LH2 fuel cell aircraft. You can see that at 1.5 times the emissions, we have a reduction in range, as is expected. But if we look at the LNG aircraft, the reduction from 1 to 1.5 is even more dramatic. And the LNG aircraft, of course, outperforms the LH at 1.5 times uh, the emissions reduction. The LH2 fuel cell outperforms uh, the LNG aircraft. And what's even more interesting is that the dual fuel aircraft, the LH2 LNG dual fuel aircraft, outperforms both of them in this low carbon region at both one times the emission reduction targets and 1.5 times the emission reduction targets. And of course, I focused on 2050 here in the graph, but I could have focused on other years, but 
2050 is our point of interest for this presentation. In conclusion, the model that was presented in this presentation was of a grid-derived liquid hydrogen-powered Boeing 787 in 2050. Under IATA decarbonisation targets, aircraft fueled with, uh, with LH2 derived from world average electricity had a reduced range, a reduced passenger number and an increased energy. And of course, we had problems with both the passenger number and the energy. Using LH2 fuel cell powered Boeing 787s, we estimate that 1.6 times the energy of the world aviation consumption was required in 2050. And we found that liquid natural gas uh, aircraft often traveled further than LH2 aircraft, but LH2 outperforms LNG in areas with low carbon grid electricity, such as North America, and also when uh, decarbonisation targets are tighter in other slightly higher carbon regions, such as Europe. In low carbon areas, LH2 LNG dual fuel aircraft perform better than either LH2 or LNG single fuel aircraft. So we see that there are certain niches where LH2 may be favourable, but we need to be mindful of the reduced passenger number, the increased energy consumption and the reduced range that come along with this. Thanks very much for listening uh, and also thank you very much for having me. Thanks, uh, Jesse, for doing so well, cramming so much information in such a short period of time. Excellent Excellent presentation, thank you. We're going into our um, next keynote um, presentation, Philippa Oldman is going to um, give us a, a talk. Uh, she is chair of our uh, Network H2 advisory board, but her day job is uh, the stakeholder engagement officer for the Advanced Propulsion Center, APC, uh, where she works with a wide range of stakeholders from government, industry, academia to create um, visionary solutions challenging existing silo solutions and challenging existing silos between sectors. Um, she's a chartered engineer and previous head of transport and manufacturing at the Institute of Mechanical Engineers. Um, and she has a, a great understanding of the challenges facing transport and manufacturing both domestically and internationally. Over to you, Philippa. Thanks, Tony. Uh, so yeah, today I'll be talking a little bit um, of background about who the Advanced Propulsion Centre are in case those of you in attendance don't know, um, a little bit how you can maybe get involved with us um, and then talk about the current state um, of policy, but also share some of the insights uh, that our team, um, analyst team have been uh, forecasting and looking at going forward um, to hopefully spark some uh, debate uh, afterwards with some questions. First of all, just a little bit um, about the APC. Uh, we are a, a government industry organization uh, set up in 2013. We were there to help the sector, automotive sector, decarbonize towards uh, low carbon solutions and therefore net zero. Um, we help to work with uh, industry and academia to build consortia to solve some of those challenges and bring forward research and development um, ideas and take them into production to grow the market. Uh, so far we've uh, invested in 175 uh, projects across the spectrum of work with over 400 project partners which accounts to around 290 million tonnes of CO2 savings which is around 2 million uh, vehicles off the road, life cycle emissions of vehicles off the road um, and supported the safeguarding or creation of around 50,000 jobs. We focus and invest in key technology areas um, so many of those you can see on there, electrical energy storage, so batteries, electric machines, power electronics, fuel cells, uh, intelligent mobility is covered by our sister organisation, Zenzik, um, lightweight vehicle and power change instructions, digitalisation, and of course, thermal propulsion systems. So I think we are one of the last uh, funding organisations that does still support uh, investment in internal combustion engines within the automotive sector, uh, looking at that with uh, particular net zero fuels, um, or hydrogen e-fuels. So really in terms of the funding streams, uh, this is the funding landscape, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. 
Uh, the network itself obviously supported EPSRC and Innovate, uh, proof of concept uh, covered by uh, Innovate UK, and that's where our technology developer accelerator program fits, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, we then have the application readiness level. So this is uh, taking those production or proved production item, prototype options and pushing them through the phase through to production uh, through collaborative research and development programs. And then finally, the industrialization at scale, which is done through our automotive transformation fund. We work across the other funding partners. So um, Faraday Battery Challenge to support the development of batteries, uh, driving the electric revolution from power electronics, motors and drives, um, and also uh, the digitalization areas with Maids Water Initiatives, which you may also know to as Brunel. Um, also not on this picture, um, but there was some funding allocated uh, through the Catapult Networks for the Hydrogen Innovation Initiative. And I have got a slide um, at the end of my presentation on that, which hopefully informs the audience a little bit more about the ambition of that group. That is carrying on whizzing through uh, collaborative research and development programs. They're often um, up to anything from two to uh, 11 partners involved in these programs. Competitions tend to run two to three times a year at costs around 5 million to 40 million. Um, and they tend to have SMEs involved, uh, academia involved, as well as an OEM and a tier one, so a route to the automotive market. However, that does not um, necessarily mean that it can't have spillover into other areas. Uh, one example can be a battery that was developed through one of our uh, CR&D programs is now being used on the work boats to help um, service the wind turbines in the North Sea. We also have the Automotive Transformation Funding. So this is this capital investment programme. So announcements include things like uh, British Vault, um, AES and Vision, uh, Ford Halewood Plant, which has transitioned uh, from looking at the uh, development of transmissions within their internal combustion engines, vehicle, uh, but now looking at the electric drive unit. So actually looking at how you reskill that workforce as well as implement new technologies and machines within the facilities to ensure that we sustain manufacturing here in the UK. There are also um, a number of feasibility studies, which is looking at looking at um, whether or not particular locations are good places to invest. And again, this funding really looks more at that upstream uh, value chain um, and, and supply chain piece. And again, many of our academic partners have been involved in supporting the development of these feasibility studies by pro providing additional insight um, to uh, many industrial partners in this area. Finally, uh, the Technology Developer Accelerator Program. Uh, so this is a particularly unique tailored uh, program around 19 months uh, for spin up startups and small businesses uh, to provide them additional support, um, 135K uh, grant support. Um, and it is really looking at helping them develop business cases, financial model, protecting uh, the IPs. Um, we'll be launching the next round of this um, in, in the autumn this year. And interestingly, uh, it works with a lot of university spin outs. And in fact, 100% um, of the um, companies that we've supported who got private investment over the last year were university spin outs. So far, the programme has engaged uh, 91 companies and those companies have, have shared in uh, the private investment equating to around 209 million. So some real rubber stamping of support um, of these companies that go through the programme uh, by the investors. So the technology trends insight piece, I'm sure many of you are familiar with these, but just to put them up so you know uh, where some of the insight that I'm going to share comes from. Um, so there's the product roadmaps that look across the vehicle types, but also the technology roadmaps that look across um, each of those different technologies, which I highlighted at the start, looking at where we are today, but also where we expect to be come 2050, looking at what the opportunities are around that. And then alongside those, we've broken them down this last time into additional areas of research um, that you may want to focus on and determine, all of which obviously support um, funding calls um, in, terms of, in, in terms of getting additional support for companies who are putting into the funding rounds. Um, they focus on short, medium and long term um, and all downloadable. Um, I will share my presentation afterwards, which we share with attendees and these links are all clickable. 
Um, also, uh, a couple of years ago now, I did some joint work with uh, Zemo Partnership and the University of Brighton, looking at the cross-sector um, approach for how we can decarbonise transport out to 2050. Um, much of this was trying to look at where there potentially could be shared innovation across the different sectors to make sure that we can form those collaborative partnerships where necessary um, to look at making a uh, best trajectory towards achieving a net zero future. So this shows what the uh, estimates were around that, that timeline um, out to 2050. And again, I'll break this down more from a, a heavy duty side of it um, in a later slide. So really, um, where we are today, we've got some uh, policy driving uh, technology development in a particular way, meaning that we have some tough decisions to make. Um, so as you know, uh, the UK has made many a commitment out to 2050 to meet net zero. And actually, one of the challenges are is how does the UK, UK automotive supply chain support this, not only in the transition of um, different technologies, but also ensuring that we retain the workforce and also the manufacturing base. Also, in addition to this, recognising that we have a lot of academic expertise surrounding the areas of internal combustion engines. How do we make sure we don't lose those skills and capabilities, either through moving them into the use of um, working with an internal combustion engine and alternative fuels or actually transitioning those engineering skills to a focus on one of the other technologies um, going forward. We know at the moment that transport accounts for around 27% of the UK's dark greenhouse gas emissions, which is currently almost double that of our produced by UK homes. We also know that there's a couple of vehicle development cycles over the next 10 years that will significantly have an, an, an impact and affect our emissions output. So actually that choice of what that mix should be is a real challenge. But as we know, um, transport energy demands are changing. Um, and really, whilst a lot of the um, evidence that we've seen um, and, and, and the insights that we've seen, it, it is deemed that you know, battery electric does answer the challenges of many of our passenger vehicles. Um, we know that the aviation side of things is still going to require a liquid fuel as with our maritime side of it, but that area in between, so the heavy duty, uh, potentially rail, some of the aerospace cars and some of the smaller maritime vessels um, will require hydrogen. The uncertainty is around uh, how much, so hence the arrows there, and that will probably be dependent on the, on the amount of range that they require um, and also the access that they have um, to those particular fuels uh, at their various ports or, or point of uh, an entry and, and where they're stopping and transitioning. Um, I talk a little bit more around the heavy duty side of it, um, around the fact uh, that cost of, uh, total cost of ownership starts to come into these calculations uh, going forward. So first of all, um, just a little bit of insight and opportunities around the uh, light duty vehicle side of things. So really, this is looking for the light, light duty, as I've said, um, and you can see a particular growth from the insight that we've been looking at. Um, through the work of looking at, at our analysis, but some work we did with um, FEB and also Bloomberg NEF, um, looking at the trajectory of how this will change over time. So you see, as you would expect, that vehicles with the internal combustion engine starting to diminish um, the growth in battery electric, but also the growth, significant growth uh, in fuel cell vehicles. And actually, this is something that we are seeing with some of the projects that are coming through the APC, a lot more um, submissions now into uh, hydrogen and fuel cells than just a few years ago. I'm sure many of the audience know this, uh, but this is just a breakdown uh, of a fuel cell um, and how they're made up to provide some, some insight in case you aren't familiar um, with it. And some estimations that we um, see at the moment is that you, you have the, for where you have the fuel cell system, if you like, so including uh, the balance of plant, um, the cost at the moment of that, it takes up around 57% of the fuel cell, while the um, hydrogen tank and its ancillaries take up around 43% of the cost. So actually, how can we look at uh, reducing the overall cost in, in, the, in the total system? And can we make it um, a competitive?
So some work that we did uh, through the APC looked at actually what is the opportunity um, around the automotive uh, so fuel cell uh, system components and can we really get this? So at the moment, we know that we're producing less than 0.1 um, of a gigawatt a year um, of fuel cell stacks in the UK. And actually the ambition and the demand that will be required will be around 14 gigawatts. Uh, by the time we get to 2035. Uh, likewise, we see this growth um, in, in the tanks themselves. So actually, how can we start to get um, the right, attract the right manufacturers here or take advantage of those organizations that we know who have development in this area and IP within this area? How can we work with them to scale up um, their investment, but also their access to the materials that they need to start to meet the associated demands uh, that we see going forward um, into the future. Um, we estimate that there is an opportunity here um, for currently uh, items that are made manufacturing in the UK um, is around 15%. And actually, we believe there's an opportunity here for around 65 percent of the value to be made here so that's taking out that sort of that value of, of the, the whether it be the balance of plant or the, the hydrogen tank and the fuel cell it's fuel cell stack itself how can we actually capture some of that and the things that we are seeing are various technological advancements bringing forward the commercial viability of this in terms of that demand is starting to um, drive the um, volume and dictate the volume ramp up that's needed by the industry uh, to make sure that we're looking at it, but also the challenge around the hydrogen refueling networks is something that, as you can imagine, uh, we are starting to hear a lot of noise about and starting to encounter, um, as we have done with the um, electric vehicle infrastructure. Uh, one of the challenges uh, that we are hearing uh, more and more about, actually, is the access to uh, green hydrogen being available for that test and development side, so that real research and development side, and challenges uh, with both academia and industry having access um, to that green hydrogen and actually it, unless that starts to happen at the rate which is required um, obviously it would mean that we could potentially miss the boat in developing some of this um, game-changing technology and seeing the growth required in the manufacturing that we will need. Um, this is something uh, that we produce. So we did this previously um, with our batteries and our, and our um, power electronics, and it, it received a lot of um, positive uh, feedback, I suppose, from both academia and industry to understand uh, where they might want to play. Uh, so you can see where the semi-finished products are in the, in the darker colours, um, but also where the manufacturing happen has. So where can you um, currently capture um, some of the areas here um, to look at driving forward? I mean, recognising, and, and I think one of the challenges is as well, not only from scaling up the demand to, to um, meet, meet, meet that future demand, but also recognizing where in the system there are some challenges in terms of that sustainability agenda, um, recognizing that, for example, some of the, the, um, the initial processing piece at the front up front here before the, the, the proton electron membranes can be very nasty chemical uses. So actually are there alternative and a lot of research uh, and investigation uh, going on in that area. So how do we really drive forward um, some of the challenges there to make sure that we are making sure that sustainability uh, is a key aspect taken forward in future demand. So here is again, as I've already just talked a little bit about this, but some of the key parts and this is some work we've been doing with uh, the Department for International Trade to really understand how we can anchor um, and benefit and build some of the supply chain around the areas of fuel cells uh, within the UK. Um, so really, we've seen um, our investment through the Automotive Transformation Fund that I talked about uh, with Johnson Matthey, who are obviously looking at scale up towards a, a gigafactory in, in their Royston facility, um, supporting that um, a development of the, of the membrane side of it, uh, also looking at how we can create some inward investment uh, in the tier ones and the OEMs, but also one of the biggest challenges we have is around the hydrogen tanks. Now we know that we have organizations such as 
um, looks for headed up here in the UK and headquartered here in the UK. However, they currently don't have the manufacturing capacity um, that we have. So really marrying up some of those connections between what we're being told by um, industry and where we're highlighting some of the research and development that's happening to those organisations, hopefully gives them the sense of um, purpose and the sense of uh, reliability that actually the, the growth and the demand will be there if they were to take some of those investment decisions. So how does this look um, as, as we go forward? And actually, this is a, an interesting chart that was, um, again, produced uh, by our Tech Trends team working with uh, an organisation called Austin Power, which is an absolute classic name for those of you who probably are similar age to myself. Um, but it's really looking at um, the cost, the, the cost of where we can drive out, where we can drive out cost uh, in development from a light duty um, PMD fuel cell system, um, including, and here you can see the chart is quite useful. Um, and again, it's probably something that you may want to have a look at after the, after the event itself um, to see where there are significant reductions being made. But as you can see from first glance, actually there's a significant cost uh, reduction in the fuel fuel stack um, as we obviously see the the demand go up and the volume going up in that area and the economies of scale however there will be significant uh, challenges around the hydrogen uh, tank area but also opportunities around the fuel cell balance apart so you can see there um, that um, there's a, and there's a link in in the deck uh, that we uh, estimate or OEMs are, are working for around uh, $80 per kilowatt hour for battery cots at a pack level around 2030. And um, our estimates and, and ambition and the research that we've done around this area is looking around $86 kilowatt, um, dollars per kilowatt hour for a fuel cell system. Um, so I think that is quite um, an interesting insight into the area where actually, you know, those um, vehicles that potentially are larger, so the SUVs, and the light and light duty vans and the vans that are going around actually this demonstrates that fuel cells potentially um, are a very good viable option so what about larger vehicles just a few slides on there um, to show that you know actually i think predominantly um, this is an area where hydrogen uh, has a big opportunity um, so we can see here this is a, a total cost of ownership um, address uh, measurements that we did. And I think one of the things here is, is obviously we know that for some of the batteries that will be required um, in, a, in a truck, it will take up a lot of the payload area. And actually that means a loss of money, um, which obviously isn't very attractive to the operators. And again, you can see here by about 2035, you're ending up with a sort of a cost parity, if you like, really with both the, um, the BEV and the fuel cell options. Um, we are, and, and, and that a lot of that comes from obviously as well, the reduction in the amount of time for stoppage um, because of the, the distance that will be able to be covered without the needing to uh, retake the time to recharge. So actually, it's a really interesting um, chart. And again, something that we, we fed into the consultation response that the government did um, probably about, I don't remember how long it was ago now, everything's a bit of a blur in terms of timings, um, but again, something that we're looking for, and again, hopefully will feed into some of the um, Department for Transport Zero Emission uh, freight trials. Um, in terms of the um, likely pathways, here on the left-hand side, you can see we've broken it down into the regional delivery services. And so that's sort of your, your medium duty vehicles. Um, and then of course, to your long range uh, duty, long range services and how they will, they will affect. And we've put in there the, the policy and the EU, the UK legislation drivers um, to make it sort of easy to read across. Um, so you can see there that actually um, we will, we believe that, you know, fuel cells, um, and batteries offer an opportunity to that medium duty for that regional side of it. Um, a lot of the challenges around um, the emissions within cities and low emission zones, um, but really to uh, get some of that long range delivery services, um, we can see that um, hydrogen combustion is a real solution there um, and are definitely within Europe. But I think this is where there will be a lot more discussions in terms of how we 
view this going forward and versus the UK um, legislation versus the European and actually where will they overlap and be complementary and where will they separate out and, and that can be a, a challenge and again recognizing that you know the UK already exports a lot of its um, engines and so actually that still remains an, a good export market for us going forward and we don't want to lose that. Um, so really, again, just another one of these mixed cycles for you, um, and it has these the European uh, figures, and as you can see, predominantly, um, uh, it will start to move from um, combustion engine to uh, fuel cell and BEV by around 2040 going forward, so moving some 62% diesel in 2030 to around 70% uh, BEV and fuel cell vehicles, as long as the, obviously the manufacturing is there, but this is what demand is saying to us and the infrastructure is there, I should say, um, again, which is all challenging questions going forward. So the last bit that I just said I would touch on uh, before I'll take some questions is some of the challenges across the sectors. Um, this was a, a, a discussion and this hygiene innovation initiative um, has come about from that challenge around the end to end um, piece around what do we do um, about making sure that, you know, we are using um, green hydrogen where possible um, and looking at making sure we've got the right um, amount or, or feedstocks from it. And actually, how do we then uh, distribute and what the, what's the consumer demand at the end and trying to ensure that we have there's a lot of investment going into different parts of the value chain um, across the UK, but actually joining that up to recognise the system um, is a really, really important aspect of it. Um, so the APC from an automotive perspective has been looking at this, as have the aerospace uh, technology institutions of the ATI. Um, from an aerospace perspective, recognising that we are the consumers of the hydrogen, but actually that there is a lot more to happen before we can start using it and actually um, whilst you know but our vehicles need a, a trajectory for development time so the hydrogen needs to be there for them to use not only through the development time but also at the end so actually this is a, a piece of work that's received from funding um, from uh, the, the government to look and work with um, ourselves and many of the catapult centers so actually working with the manufacturing catapult offshore renewable transport um, connected places to actually start to bring groups together and on that industrial advisory board we have everybody from the end uh, 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 producer or the start of the system so the producers so the likes of um, the large uh, oil giants are on there so you as you would imagine BP as they transition there at zero and also recognizing at the moment potentially there is some blue hydrogen there but how do they then convert that to green and what do they do with theirs? And I learned about turquoise hydrogen the other day, which I'd not, I'd not heard about before. Um, so actually, how do we ensure that the right feedstocks are going in through the system, but then they're getting distributed in the right way? And um, we'll obviously be linking in with the, um, the this network, um, as well as many other EPSRC uh, networks to bring the consortiums together to make sure that we have the right uh, deliverable and the right solutions for the UK going forward. That's it from me. Please reach out to the APC if you don't know us. Um, I'm happy to uh, take any questions now uh, and discuss any opportunities around future strategy and funding. Um, but I've also put Luke on there as well, who leads on much of our supply um, hydrogen analysis, uh, looking at the sector and opportunities around the sector going forward. So again, please feel free to reach out to him directly as well. Thanks very much, uh, Philippa, uh, for a great presentation. We look forward to uh, APC supporting hydrogen transport um, in the future. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Tony. Thanks for inviting me to speak today, and I'll share the slides. And like I said, if anyone has any questions, feel free to get in touch. Let's uh, move on to our next presentation. Um, this is going to be given by Dr. Siva Sigurdan uh, from Imperial College uh, London. Uh, Siva is a research fellow in the Department of Materials at Imperial. His research focuses on the development of electrode and electrolyte uh, materials for energy conversion and storage devices, especially for solid oxide fuel cells, photonic ceramic fuel cells, and metal air batteries. Over to you, Siva. Yeah. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. 
I'm Siva Prakash Singh Gowda and I'm working as an Imperial College Research Fellow for the past four years at Imperial College London and Department of Materials. So my talk is about, about ammonia fueled proton conducting solid oxide fuels, proton conducting solid oxide fuel cells. So generally the basic principle of solid oxide fuel cell is uh, illustrated here. Uh, uh, similar like other electrochemical devices, solid oxide fuel cells contain three essential components. There's the cathode, electrolyte and the anode. And the anode is made up of nickel zirconium oxide composite. And the electrolyte is zirconium oxide, a stabilized zirconium oxide. And then the cathode, cathode material is either perovskite oxide, it can be a lanthanum strontium magnetite or lanthanum strontium cobaltite. But what are the main advantages of the solid oxide fuel cell is the direct conversion of fuels into electricity because of fuel cell operating at higher temperature, it have a give, it gives higher efficiency. Uh, more more environmental friendly and then fuel flexibility because the uh, yeah, electrolyte is a, uh, a solid electrolyte it have a fuel flexibility from wide range of fuels uh, from pure hydrogen to hydrocarbons but the main disadvantage is the performance degradation when goes when decreasing operating temperature so operating temperature at hi operating higher temperature have a, a degradation issues in uh, all the components of the fuel cells and then again corrosion issues due to the high temperature but we want to decrease the temperature uh, uh, to, to eliminate those corrosion and degradation issues. But uh, decreasing the uh, temperature will, uh, will uh, greatly decrease the efficiency and performance of the fuel cell. Um, the another problem is the high thermal stress, uh, that is the high thermal stress at the imp uh, interfaces uh, in the, uh, between the uh, components of the fuel cell, for example, between the electrolyte and the cathode. Uh, there is a, a, a thermal uh, mismatch between the thermal expansion coefficient. Because of that, we can see often see a, a delamination. So uh, the immediate requirement is to decrease the operating temperature of fuel cell from 1000 degrees Celsius to lower temperature. So uh, when we decreasing the lower temperature, we see that cathode degradation, and then low uh, cathode activity. The, the alternative choices are uh, is shown here is the uh, proton conducting solid oxide fuel cell, which can operate at a low temperature, uh, uh, for example, at uh, uh, 450 degrees Celsius to 600 degrees Celsius. The another advantage is that activation energy for protonation is very high compared to oxidation conductors because of that the efficiency is increased. Um, uh, so and then uh, uh, still still uh, uh, the research is going on for the development of uh, cathode materials in solid oxide fuel cells. Uh, here the image shows the uh, uh, operating principle of solid oxide electrolysis cells, uh, uh, proton conducting cells, like a conventional uh, uh, solid oxide fuel cell, uh, proton ceramic solid oxide fuel cell also has anode, electrolyte and cathode, uh, except uh, electrolyte, the cathode and the anode material are same. The electrolyte is here is a proton conductors uh, uh, ceramics. In this case here, we use barium zirconate C-rate solid solutions. So the main advantage is that it has a low energy of activation for protonation and high ionic conductivity and the good fuel utilization. So when, when fuel, un, uh, uh, we don't mean, when fuel is passed at the anode uh, uh, byproduct, that is the water is formed at the cathode, uh, uh, cathode side only. Because of that, we, we don't need to uh, have a, a dilution issues uh, that happened in the solid oxide, oxide ion based solid oxide fuel cells. The main disadvantage is it has a low protonic conductivity at grain boundaries and high polarization resistance at the cathode. So traditionally the mixed ionic electronic conductors are used as the electrode materials for solid oxide fuel cells. So mixed ionic conductors, for example, here is a uh, lanthanum strontium cobalt oxide. Uh, so, um, since it's a mixed ionic electronic conductor, it can conduct only uh, oxide ion electron, uh, and then um, big, um, it will not conduct a proton uh, proton in the in L lanthanum strontium cobalt oxides. So, because of this, the performance is de decreased, uh, and then the, the electrochemical reaction happens only at the triple phase boundaries where the proton and the oxide ion and the electron meets. Because of this, we need to develop a cathode material that can be active and active on the entire surface of the cathode. 
So one proposal is about the development of triple conducting oxide. The triple conducting oxide is uh, oxide material that can conduct oxidion, proton, and then electrons. So, uh, so, so when we develop this uh, triple conducting oxide ions uh, as a cathode, uh, oxide cathode, uh, not only the triple phase boundaries here, but the entire surface of the cathode metal with, will be active for uh, oxygen reduction reaction and uh, water formation reactions. So the main requirement for the SOFC elect, I mean, soft fuel cell proton conducting so ceramic electrode is catalytic active for oxygen reduction reactions and then hydrogen oxidation reaction at the anode uh, on, uh, um, on, on all the surface of the electrode. And the uh, next uh, requirement, it should be electronically conductive. Uh, it should conduct the uh, uh, electrons uh, from the uh, surface of the electrode to the external circuit. Uh, if, they, if there is a conductivity, uh, if, if the oxidation con conducting material is not electronically conductive, there will be a huge loss in the performance of the uh, fuel cells. And it should be ionically conductive. For example, in here uh, in, 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 in oxidation based solid oxide fuel cell, it should be conductive for oxidation uh, from, from cathode to the anode for uh, fuel oxidation reactions. In, in the case of proton conducting ceramic fuel cell, it should conduct the uh, proton from anode through the electrolyte onto the cathode surface to form the uh, water reactions. And then again, the material should be compatible with uh, other components of the fuel cell. You should not react with other components of fuel cell. For example, if the uh, cathode material is there, means it should not react with the uh, electrolyte uh, material. So when all the four conditions need has to be met by a good electrode uh, for uh, proton conducting fuel cells. Based on these strategies, researches were performed on single perovskite, that's the barium, strontium, cobalt, iron oxide, or lanthanum, strontium, cobalt, iron oxides. So, so these fuel, uh, ceramic oxide materials are well established in uh, oxide ion based solid oxide fuel cells. However, in proton conducting solid oxide fuel cells, these materials are perform very poorly because this, these materials are not a triple conducting oxides where it can, cannot be able to conduct um, um, uh, proton, oxide ion, and the electron simultaneously. So we developed, so in previous my research, I, I developed a layered perovskite oxides uh, that the, uh, which have a layered structure, uh, which can conduct both um, it can conduct all that ions, that is the oxide ion, the electron, and then uh, proton conductors. And then apart from the triple ionic conduction property, it has a further advantage because of its high uh, electronically conductive material and have a fast oxygen diffusion and surface exchange kinetics in fuel cell electrode conditions uh, from 800 to uh, from intermediate temperature from uh, 450 to 1000 degrees Celsius, and had a, it has an excellent durability. So this is a, uh, uh, my previous work. We, I have shown that uh, um, uh, um, neodymium, barium, strontium, cobalt, iron oxide as a layer perovskite oxide used as a cathode material in barium, zirconate, cerate, yttrium, uh, elect electrolyte, and then nickel, barium, zirconate, cerium, yttrium, yttribium, uh, and composite anode. Uh, at 600 degrees Celsius, 650 degrees Celsius, um, uh, it shows very low ohmic resistance and then the um, uh, low uh, non ohmic resistance and shows the excellent uh, uh, maximum power density of 1.05 watts uh, per centimeter square at 600 degree, 650 degrees Celsius. Moreover, we shown that there is a stability uh, with, without any degradation more than 500 hours. So my, 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 in this research, I have taken uh, triple conducting oxides uh, uh, for for the development of uh, uh, um, ammonia powered uh, protonic ceramic solid oxide fuel cells. So in in this in this research, I have, I have used uh, uh, prismidium, barium, strontium, cobalt, iron oxide as a cathode material, and then we synthesized at uh, 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 1150 degrees Celsius, and then it shows no. Uh, 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 impurity peaks in carbon dioxide. Uh, it shows that excellent stability and durability. And uh, um, uh, BCCYB, this is the barium zirconate, cerate, yttrium, yttrium oxide, 
electrolyte was prepared and then the compatibility test was uh, performed at 950 degrees Celsius. It shows there is no uh, 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 solid state reaction between the electrolyte and the electrode for uh, from 9900 to uh, 11, uh, 1000 degrees Celsius. Then fabricate a solid oxide fuel cells that is based on uh, barium zirconate cerate with nickel, with nickel as the anode and then the electrolyte and then the cathode. The electrolyte thickness is about 10 to 15 micrometer and the cathode thickness is about 20 micrometers. This image shows the cathode cross-section micro, uh, I mean, top V micro, uh, microstructural image. It shows that it having the enough porosity uh, for both oxygen production reactions and then for uh, water formation reaction to come out from the cathode. This is the cross-sectional image of a cathode surface, which this is the uh, cathode surface at 950 degrees Celsius without surface modification. It shows that uh, the cathode uh, have enough porosity and then the interface is well good connected. So then uh, I modified the surface of the uh, uh, cathode uh, by infiltration of P presimidium barium strontium cobalt uh, iron oxide solution, about 20 microliters on the surface of the cathode. And then the surface was evenly coated with uh, the prismidium barium strontium cobalt ion oxides, and then it was calcined at 700 degrees Celsius. Then we, we, we performed the fuel cell me electrochemical measurement based on uh, nickel uh, barium zirconate cerate tritiumetri oxide anode composite anode barium zirconate cerate tritium yttrium yttrium uh, electrolyte and then prismidium barium strontium cobalt ion oxide as the uh, cathode. So in the conventional anode, that is without any surface modification, the full cell shows about one watt power density, one watt per centimeter square power density at, at 650 degrees Celsius. However, when we, when we modify the performance of the, uh, modify the surface of the electrolyte, prismidium barium strontium cobalt oxide infiltration, it shows at the same temperature at 650 degrees Celsius, it shows about 1.6 watts power density. So power density was increased due to the surface modifications. And then again, here the surface is also covered with the prismidium barium, prismidium barium strontium cobalt ion oxides. This material is not a triple conducting oxide. Protons come from this uh, electrolyte was blocked and then uh, it will not show any uh, surface reactions or cathode reactions of the cathode. Since it's a triple conducting oxide, that the, the cathode layer or in, infiltration layer deposited here, uh, since it's a, a proton conductor, the protons come moves from the uh, anode to the uh, electrolyte and to the cathode. It was easily uh, transferred without any blockage. That's why the power density was increased from 1.2 watts per centimeter square to 1.6 watts power per centimeter square. So uh, until now, this research was conducted only based on the uh, ox, I mean, uh, hydrogen uh, in hydrogen fuel. So in the next step in, in future, it will be tested in uh, ammonia containing fuels. And then uh, ammonia containing fuels have another problem because the anode is, should be active for ammonia decomposition. Now my current work is uh, working on development of a catalyst for the for the uh, anode layer where we doping the uh, doping small amount of ruthenium or a palladium in this barium zirconate solid electrolyte to improve the ammonia decomposition reaction so that it can uh, easily decompose to form a hydrogen at 50 degrees celsius so based on this research uh, i secured a funding for from my next fellowship it is supported by the bp uh, international center for advanced materials at uh, uh, manchester it's a, a Catherine Lonsdale Fellowship. The fellowship is hosted uh, at Imperial College London and same department of materials. This work mainly focus on uh, development of uh, electrolysis cell for hydrogen production at intermediate temperature, solid oxide fuel cells. Thank you. Thank you very much, Siva. Our final uh, presentation today is by uh, Dr. Tama Kamal. Tamo is an assistant professor at Plymouth University. He has a PhD in uh, electrical uh, power engineering and his research interests include power electronics, power system protection, and artificial intelligence applications in power systems. Over to you, Tamo. 
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Stoney, for the introduction. So yes, uh, so in this presentation, I will uh, demonstrate our funded network H2 project. This project is investigating the development of a new smart hybrid drive system with the associated linguistic to design advanced hydrogen refueling station for railway network. First of all, hydrogen supply trains have been presented as a great candidate to replace other powertrain technologies in railway transportation. They offer reduced or zero emission option for railway transportation in various applications, which are currently powered with diesel engine or liquefied natural gas. Additionally, hydrogen system don't need to electrify the railway network or upgrade the infrastructure of the distribution grid to supply railway network. Accordingly, they will save the required infrastructure installation cost for the grid, as well as it will make access for the train in the region which are out of city or electrification of the network will become with high cost. Even so, the hydrogen cell are good energy source to provide reliable power at steady rate. They cannot respond properly to the traction fast load dynamics due to their slow internal electrochemical and thermodynamic response. On the other hand, they can be integrated with energy storage device such as lithium ion battery, which has fast dynamic to form a hybrid power source for traction system. Dual three-phase machine also offer several advantage over the typical three-phase machine utilized in traction system. They provide higher reliability in which each phase group in dual three-phase machine could be independently fed from different power source so that the fault tolerant operation can be implemented. In addition to reliability, this machine provide lower power losses, lower harmonic distortion, along with higher efficiency and power density. Accordingly, uh, in this project, we aim to develop a new smart integrated power source of fuel hydrogen cell and lithium battery cell to supply dual three phase machine for driving the train in light railway network. First of all, a number of railway case study are chosen to implement the proposed smart drive traction system. For each case study, study, the train and road data are introduced to a single terrain simulator developed in Birmingham Research Center at University of Birmingham for railway, so that the best railway line is then nominated through a selection criteria for the implementation of the new smart drive traction system in hardware in the loop platform. After that, an optimization analysis is undertaken for the hydrogen fuel cell train in order to reduce the overall hydrogen consumption with the same journey time spent. On another hand, sensitivity analysis is carried out to select the site location for the proposed hydrogen refueling station. Eventually, the equipment for the refueling station is then investigated and designed based on the optimized hydrogen demand from the optimization analysis, as well as from the site selection study. Starting with the road and the train data, for the road data, we need the gradient profile, we need the speed limit, station stop location across the road. For the, for the train data, we need Davis equation, which describes the train resistance during the motion as a function of its speed. Also, we need the mass of the train, auxiliary electrical load power. On the other hand, we need uh, for the selection criteria that are applied to nominate the best railway line uh, for implementation of the proposed system. These factors are the estimated hydrogen consumption for the rolling stock in each case study, operational factors to check if the rolling stock required in other surface or line, and finally, number of rolling stocks units required for the line under the study. Each of these criteria is scored from one to five through a number of category, which is empirically defined from the contribution and the feedback from a number of hydrogen and railway experts. Each of these criteria is also weighted in the final score uh, in, in the final score based on their importance in which the estimated hydrogen consumption is the most important factor to determine the best line for the implementation. 
then the operational factor becoming the next, since it also introduced some challenging to determine if further hydrogen is required for any other surface, in addition to the line under the study. Finally, the number of employed units is coming at last, which contribute to define the line reliability. We have four case studies for railway are chosen in this project, Santa Airs to Santa Ice branch, Heart of Wales line, Whirly lines and Fenmus branch, in which the line of highest score becomes Santa Airs to Santa Ives, uh, which is then implemented for the new drive traction system in the hardware in the loop platform. Uh, in this slide, the figure on the left illustrates the schematic for the new hybrid drive traction system to feed a, a dual three-phase machine by fuel cell and lithium ion battery cell. The proposed smart management system for the new drive traction system is demonstrated in the flow, in the flow chart as a right, in which the power sharing algorithm between the power, the two power source is governed by the operational mode of the train, as well as the state of charge of the battery. So if the battery is in the charging mode and the train is accelerating, so the fuel cell will contribute to its rated power to drive the train and the battery cell will also support the fuel cell to drive the train if needed. However, once the train is decelerating or braking, the fuel cell power will be then go to zero and the regenerative braking power will be then used to charge the battery. While if the train is costing, which means that it, it run at approximately fixed speed with lower power consumption, then the fuel cell will be either supply both the train and the battery if the battery set of charge is less than, is less than 90% or, or, or only the train if the battery state of charge is greater than 90%. On another hand, if the battery is greater, the state of charge of the battery uh, is in charging mode and the train is accelerating or posting, then the battery is regulated to be charged by the difference of the power between the fuel cell and the train. And once the train is, is decelerating, the battery is in charging only from the regenerative braking power of the train and the fuel cell is then set to zero. At last, the battery is then converted to the charging mode once the state of charge of the battery become higher than 90%. So number of plots to demonstrate the system performance is showing in this slide, where the gradient of the line under the study is given in the top left, where the positive slope indicates the train rising a hill, where a negative slope denotes the train moving downward. The second figure in the top right shows the IQ rep, which refers to the train traction power. Also rising upward means the train consuming power, positive IQ ref, while moving downwards means that the train is decelerating and generating power, which in negative IQ ref. The speed profile is given in the figure in the bottom left, which shows the train motion across the stop station in the line under the study. Finally, we have the torque waveform of the train in the figure in the Bottom right, the electromagnetic TEL referred to the train traction power, while TR is the train resistance torque that depends on the root gradient. Regarding the two power sources, the fuel cell and the lithium ion battery cell, IQ1 and the IQ1 ref is related to the fuel cell actual and desired power respectively. Similarly for IQ2 and IQ2 ref for the lithium battery cell, uh, the IFC is the battery, uh, is the fuel cell current uh, that is shown in the figure bottom left. Uh, and this is also related to the power requirement for the fuel cell. Finally, the set of charge of the battery is given in the figure in the bottom right during the train mission profile under the study. After that, an optimization analysis is carried out for the hydrogen fuel cell train. This optimization aims to reduce the overall hydrogen consumption with the same journey time spent. The validation considers the hydrogen consumption and the actual journey time, which are evaluated through a dynamic terrain simulator. An optimization algorithm called the practical swarm optimization is employed in this project. This optimization can generate new variables to find the optimal solution. The optimization uh, objective function includes the hydrogen consumption in kilogram weight hydrogen, the symbol is weight hydrogen, and the actual journey time difference. The consumption of the hydrogen is used in two parts, 
the first one is consumed by the fuel cell during the train operation and the other for compensating the battery energy consumption. So in some scenarios, the battery discharge more energy than they charge by the regenerative braking power. So the fuel cell needs to consume additional hydrogen to charge the battery to its start state after its stop. The optimization function is shown here, where F equal the weight of the hydrogen plus W, which is the importance factor of the time, multiply the actual journey time difference. The test route for the, opt for the optimization analysis is chosen from Santa Ives to Santa Ives branch. There are five stations in total located in this route. The total length of the route is 6.7 kilometer and it will be 13.4 uh, 13 kilometer if we considering the retaining bus. So to, to control the train performance smartly, the speed profile is optimized. Each of the speed profile between agent station is independent. Besides the train profile uh, includes not only the maximum speed, but also the costing speed. The train maximum speed is 80 kilometer per hour while the line speed is only limited to 48 km per hour. In the case that the traditional or the typical benchmark train operative curve is showing in the, in the top of this uh, slide. Then after considering the optimization, uh, we increase the maximum speed to uh, 60 km per hour. And also we include some costing stage to the train operation after the optimization uh, so we have here uh, the optimization variable showing in the table below, and also the the the, the, perform the performance curve of that of the train is shown in the bottom curve, including the maximum speed and the costing speed. In the table here, if uh, the max the costing speed equals the maximum speed, if there is no costing is is required between the two stations. From the view of the hydrogen consumption. The overall uh, reduction of the hydrogen is reduced by 9.6% uh, to by optimizing the speed profile. Moreover, also uh, we saw that there is more hydrogen is needed to recharge the battery uh, after the train stop. So the battery total capacity is 260 kilowatt hour, and we need additional battery energy cost around four kilowatt hour but this is still less than 2% of the total battery capacity. So the battery state of charge change is still acceptable. With respect to the size selection study, uh, also number of criteria is chosen to determine the best location for the planned hydrogen refueling station. The criteria covering the land area available, the requirement for empty coaching stocks move, and finally, if the site serves other terrain at the same location. For the land area available, hydrogen has a far lower volumetric density than diesel. Therefore, a site with more area available will be likely suitable. For empty coaching stock moves requirement, if the depot site is not located on the route uh, of the convenient location, an empty coaching stock move will be then required, and this will introduce two potential issues. The first one, additional hydrogen is required to move the train to the depot location, and also the hydrogen power rolling stock may be have additional interface with other train, for example, by having to run on main line to reach the depot site. This will also increase the risk of collision and safety become potentially decreased. Uh, for requirement to serve other rolling stock, if the site has to serve other rolling stock in addition to the hydrogen powered train, this will increase the risk of maintenance error, reduce the space available for fuel storage and other equipment. Each criteria is also ranged from one to five points, and they also weighted to their importance. The land area available becomes the most important factor, and the uh, last one is the other rolling stock becomes the least important one. There are three possible sites to investigate, and the one at site uh, Santa Airs reaches the highest score based on the developed selection criteria. Number of selective analysis are carried out by modifying the weight of each of the proposed selection factor. For example, lower importance is assigned for land available, uh, land available area. However, uh, Santa Airs become also the highest in such a condition. 
another weighting adjustment is applied by giving equal weighting for the whole three factor. Also, center else is still the best candidate site. On another hand, assuming that it is desirable to have the site to serve other rolling stock alongside the hydrogen terrain, therefore the scoring for such a factor will be swapped, which means that the one in which other terrain and the requirement on site will be given the highest score, while the one with no requirement to other stock will be given the lowest score. In such a case, then the site becomes the best alternative to have the refueling station. This is also applied if we give equal weighting for all factors. Uh, the final step is to investigate the equipment requirement for the refueling station. Firstly, for the required hydrogen demand, this will be either delivered to the refueling station from other location, or the hydrogen will be produced locally at the refueling station. For the delivery approach, uh, UK still have very limited hydrogen production, which is primarily used in the chemical industry. As a result, the production option will be the better choice for such a study. On the other hand, the produced full hydrogen cell grant must be extremely pure, around 100%, with low or no emission during the production process. Therefore, water electrolysis process is nominated in this project for the hydrogen production, since it just produces hydrogen and oxygen. So the design for the hydrogen refueling station at Santa Earth is illustrated in this slide, in which it consists of six successive stages as follows. The first one is the production stage using the water electrolysis unit, then a compressor to store the produced hydrogen at high pressure for fast refueling procedure. Then the high pressure hydrogen will be then stored in, in stage three. And then chilling and dispensing process are required before refueling the hydrogen into the train since the temperature rise with the high pressure of the hydrogen. Uh, number five is the serving stage, is used for other maintenance purposes or replacement of any consumables. And finally, stabling or parking the train if it is not in use. Uh, thank you for uh, your attention during the presentation. Thank you, Tamar. Uh, thanks for a, a really good presentation.